everybody. I just good morning. I just wanted to give you an update. Uh, we're going to start in about one minute. We're just waiting for the live stream uh, to reload so that the people at home can see us. So you have a, a minute to continue Sorry. kibitzing amongst yourselves. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, thank you. Good morning. We're going to call the meeting of February 12th, 2019 to order, and I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Supervisor Leopold. Here. Friend. Here. Caput. Here. McPherson. Here. Chair Coonerty. Here. Thank you. And uh, we are now stand uh, and have a moment of silence and the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, we'll now move on to item number three, which is the consideration of late additions to the agenda or any addition or deletions to the agenda. Do we have any, Mr. Palacios? Uh, yes, we have two additions to the regular agenda. Item nine, there's additional materials, a revised attachment A, packet page 171, and attachment D, grant information worksheet, worksheet which is an insert after packet page 214. On item 10, there's additional materials. There's a replacement page, <coughs> attachment C, which is packet page 225. That's all. Great, thank you. Now moving on to item number four. This is an opportunity for members of the board to remove items from the consent agenda and put them on the, on the regular <coughs> agenda. Supervisor Friend? Nothing. Supervisor Leopold? McPherson? Supervisor Caput? No, uh, just a comment. <coughs> well, hold on. We're going to have uh, comments on consent agenda in uh, the next item. This is just the removal part. Thank you. Uh, now we're going to move to uh, item number five, which is public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us about both items on our agenda, uh, on the consent agenda, on the closed session agenda, and on the and the regular agenda if you cannot stay later, as well as public comment about items that are not on today's agenda, not on today's agenda, but within the purview of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, and um, I'm going to ask anyone who, who is able to to please stand up, and we'll um, and we'll hear the comments. And uh, please begin. Gary Richard Arnold, uh, Chairman, Supervisors. I see this as more as a kabuki theater and a Punch and Judy show where oath to the Constitution are somewhat like uh, Khrushchev talked about crackers or whatever, they're made to be broken. The long-term goals honoring uh, Hugh DeLacy and the proclamation, honoring that communist spy swearing their allegiance at that meeting was Gary Patton and Leon Panetta. The Gary Patton was the chairman of the board here, and this is one of the resolutions that uh, went before the board. The chairman of the People's Republic of Santa Cruz, Gary Patton, and his supervisors are much too smart to become hosts and bootlickers of Marxist dictators in this hemisphere. Uh, the Soviet war machine is being built in these communist dictatorships aimed at the jugular of the American people. A new jewel movement is directed by the DGI Cuba, Cuban agents and two Soviet ships were docked in the harbor the morning of the coup. Uh, M uh, MiG-23s were being uncrated at their new international airport. 35,000 men from the Revol People's Revolutionary Army with Soviet AK-47s uh, were being unpacked. That's when this Board of Supervisors uh, supported the coup, wanted the United States to stay out, and this board has not changed in their direction since that time, just as the support for that communist at that time uh, 
another communist, a man by the name of Carl Hessler, was also put in the congressional re record and praised by Leon Panetta in addition to Hugh DeLacy, which you have maintained two monuments honoring that Soviet communist spy today. Mr. Hessler uh, ran a uh, newspaper for the Communist Party, William Z. Foster, it was called the Federated Press League. And uh, like, uh, like DeLacy, Panetta praised him. The same organizations that are involved in this movement, uh, we had some high school kids that were attacked on the Capitol building in a phony uh, crisis actor situation. When the, when the rest of the videos came out, they found it was fixed. One of those supporters is the Romero Institute out of Santa Cruz with Mr. Daniel Sheehan. He also supported the beginning of the uh, Green Movement and Power Energy Group in this particular area. Uh, we had one of his members stand here at this podium last week. Mr. Palacios, I don't know how the hell a county administrative uh, you know, uh, operations officer is involved with Bruce McPherson, who's received thousands of dollars from a triple Chinese red communist agent, is moving and seizing the power of the local organization. If I had more time, I could give you more information. But this is outrageous. There is other deep state things Thank going you. on here. Time's and up. those people will be brought up on Pred, sure. Pred Poll yeah. and next door, Thank including you. you, Chairman. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, good morning, board. Uh, Benjamin Kogan here, and just a request to inform yourselves about chemtrails and geoengineering. Uh, I know we stopped the spray for the spotted brown apple moth. Want to bring awareness to this topic, which I'm very concerned about, the health and freedom uh, of our citizens here in Santa Cruz. And this is a global thing. Geoengineering is the science of weather modification. Um, also, um, request to know and familiarize yourself with Agenda 21, which is the United Nations mandate to take over our local politics and create it over a regionalization umbrella. We can uh, prove this with AMBAG, Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, Plan Bay Area in, uh, in the Bay Area, and it's, a, it's a, a balance of localization versus regionalization. And uh, if we keep losing our local rights, we won't really have a Santa Cruz left and a leg to stand on. Also, I'm a firm no and request that we don't uh, put treated sewage water into our aquifer and that we don't build a desalin plant um, that will lose the structure, we'll, we'll lose Santa Cruz to both those in our authenticities. Um, uh, and, uh, and then also um, would like to, you know, just uh, create partnership in figuring out how we can solve this homeless problem, maybe uh, find a designated sp place of land. And I'm sorry, this is just public comment, right? Well, Free speech? Well, but it, you're, if, if you're going to be speaking about that, those items, then, then you've spoken about them for today, because they're on today's agenda. I'm just, just clarifying that these, that you're intending the to speak. Issues of homelessness are on today's agenda. Oh, yeah. I got it. So I did not know that. Which you're welcome Thank to you. speak to right now, but I just want to make clear that you're speaking to them right now. I was not clear on that. Okay. Um, and so then I will not speak on those right now. Um, but anyways, uh, thank you for letting me voice the opinion of this to inform the masses, since you are leaders and representatives, um, and if I can support you in these issues that I talked, chemtrails, geoengineering, um, Agenda 21, um, and even uh, to reinvestigate vaccines, um, because there are harmful side effects to that, uh, that is my request, because SB 277 has passed, and that's not something I'm all right with. Uh, for me, it's parents that get to choose what they want for their kids to have, and if the, the, the benefits are there, then they can choose freely. But there's a risk right now, part of the risk of vaccines is uh, if you do the measles vaccines, you could get measles, and I've met countless parents that have had suffering due to vaccines. So, appreciate it, um, and thank you. Good morning, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos. I want to first point out that um, I 
At the end of the agenda, I no longer see correspondence to your board submitted by the public. I used to see that often, and I myself have submitted correspondence to you as a citizen, and I don't see it in your agenda. So um, Ms. I Ms. do Member. see communication from receiving commissions and things like that, but I just want to make it clear that it seems like the public's communication to you is not being made public the way it used to be. And I also want to request that uh, the CAO follow up on, on uh, Director Leopold's request for the change to public input during board or supervisor meetings to come back with a six month recommendation. That, those actions were taken the end of June and we are long overdue for that report back to the effectiveness of those uh, actions. I also want to uh, speak to consent agenda item number 20, specifying uh, complete slurry seal and re-striping of the uh, parking lot in, at the 5200 Chanticleer Public Safety Area. This is a new facility. The parking lot there is in great shape. I go there regularly, and so I'm really questioning the, the wisdom of the expense of this uh, county money when our parking lot out here is in shambles. I would like you not to approve this because I think that it is not necessary and I think that the money, the taxpayer money, can be better spent in an area that truly needs the work. I also want to discuss um, item number uh, 40, the county's water uh, resources management status report. Um, I. I uh, want to take note that it reports that even though last year was a dry year, groundwater levels recovered. And I want to let you know that in, um, in Soquel Creek Water District, their use actually was up 240 acre feet. So we have a very resilient groundwater situation here. And I have brought legal action against Soquel Creek Water District. I have enjoined the county as a party of real interest because you were named on the notice of determination that was filed by the district for the project. I want to let you know I'm taking this action pro per because I am so shocked at the sham of environmental impact report and lack of public process that the district took to shove this through. It will have grave impacts on the mid-county area, not just for the district, but they have shut out people. And Supervisor Leopold, thank you for your comments at their December 18th hearing. It was not a hearing, it was a meeting. It did not have to be noticed. It was shoved through very, very uh, much in a surprise. So Thank I, I want to let you up. know I'm doing this because I care about the community. And I'm not asking for money. It's a writ of mandate. Thank you. Thank you. Morning. Uh, Tony Crane representing a community in Aptos uh, regarding the second story program. Uh, we haven't received a response to our uh, most recent letter uh, requesting a meeting to try to avoid uh, further actions. Um, uh, we, over the last year and a half, uh, have followed the rules. Uh, we've been cordial, uh, but we need to know um, if you're gonna keep the promises that uh, you had made to us uh, or continue to let uh, Encompass, who is a county contractor, uh, dictate the morals and ethics by which you administer the will of the taxpayers. Um, we've provided you over this last year and a half, actually a year and a half ago, with irrefutable evidence of malfeasance by county employees uh, and Encompass employees, um, which ultimately resulted uh, indirectly um, in the forfeiture of vital grant funds forfeited because everybody knew that they never should have taken the money in the first place and that there was malfeasance occurred in getting the money to buy this property. That property does not belong where it is, the, uh, the program. Um, yet Encompass was allowed to retain the property they acquired by defrauding the taxpayers and lying to the public. And they continue to operate that program um, that you have publicly stated, uh, uh, 
Supervisor Friend, should not be in our neighborhood. And in fact, promises were made that the program would leave the neighborhood. So here we are in 2019, um, and we're at wit's end. We've done everything we can. We've taken every administrative uh, tact to try to uh, get you to realize that this shouldn't be there and that, that it, it arrived there in an improper and unethical and illegal manner. Um, so at this point, if I have to reveal each and every one of these bits of evidence three minutes at a time at the meetings, I'll do that. I don't think anybody wants that. The, the evidence that we have is irrefutable. It's emails, people saying things they shouldn't have said, and it's very clear that they had no intention of ever meeting the terms of the grant that they received, and those monies have since been, again, forfeited because they could never meet the terms because it's improper, it's illegal. Um, so uh, please respond to our, our letter. Uh, I'd like to have a meeting before we, again, begin what we've, I've tried to avoid all this time, which is legal and public announcements and things like that. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning. Last time I was here, I looked like Santa Claus. I'm a great camper, Richard Lewis. I know most of you are about this much. Particularly today, I have three things I'd like to share. One is prior in Watsonville and in Santa Cruz, we had a youth city council made up of high school. Sending emails doesn't mean that somebody even opens it up, so I'm here in person to share and ask you as county, as you remember, you had six years where a former Santa Cruz board created a structure countywide for youth. Not that you're gonna tell me, but I hope that you did look at, as a board, what we're gonna have in Santa Cruz County that reflects youth voice and student empowerment as an international youth right. The other two things I wanna verbalize and ask you to do some research of staff. One is called Carry the Vision. Some of you know Dave Cortese over the hill. Two years like you, Ryan, headed up, and I think he still is, their board of supervisors. Carrythevision.org. Bring it to Santa Cruz. That's an invitation. We made it known to, at the last no quorum of the Latino Affairs Commission, last year they met four times, two staff, their next meeting is April. As supervisors, you particularly, John, you had interest in Latinos to get them involved. How can you have no quorum with people representing Watsonville, Santa Cruz, Scotts Valley? Now, the other is very, very important. Nationally, welcomingamerica.org. And the last is out of San Diego, and that is welcoming uh, for uh, sd.org. Please, they got a five-year strategic plan to welcome immigrants. Ask staff to look at it and see what you can do to complement whatever your strategic plan is for those who don't have papers that are our residents. I'm gonna be 82. I appreciate some of the relationships, but last, Create a next generation, a commission. That's nextgeneration.org. Come on, let's listen to that 18 to, to 40, get them involved, unlike the Latino, they won't, they'll be, have a quorum. They'll begin to bring the voice to advise you of what young people in our county want to see you do. So no more an organization, a great panther. Pretty soon, Bruce, you may be like me, 80 years young. LGBT, we got 60 plus for that population. And I'm here not to speak to you today, but I'm here because of the homeless issue. So I want to say, please, I can send or get you emails. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Melissa Freebear, and I'm a local mom, a local resident, and a local registered nurse. 
I've worked for the county before at the jail as a nurse at Juvenile Hall, and I currently work as a nurse at the state prison in Soledad. I'm here to speak to agenda item number eight and also the homeless issue. Um, we spend a lot of money in this town on programs to help people. And unfortunately, some of these programs that are meant for harm reduction actually harm the community more than they actually do good. So what I'm specifically here to speak about is your syringe program and the unintended consequences of not running that program correctly, okay? Your last statistics from December show that 80 of your clients were homeless. You're supposed to get a medical exemption if you pass out more than 100 syringes. Out of those clients that access the service, over 86 of them got over 200 syringes dispensed alone in the month of December. So out of 54,329 syringes, what you're calculating is that only 191 were unaccounted for. I'm here to tell you that every time I go down to Seabright Beach and our watershed, within five minutes I can pick up a dirty needle. That's unacceptable. As a medical professional, this is medical biohazard. And in my facility, if I missed an unaccounted one syringe, that would be a $75,000 fine from OSHA. So the community is fed up for a reason. You're spending money on a program and you're not running it properly. You're not collecting meaningful data on these addicts to actually show that you're helping anyone or stopping the spread of HIV or hepatitis C in this county. So I'm here to hold you accountable for the money that's spent. And I'm also here to speak on the FIT program is a great program. So put some money behind it. We already spent $25 million on 64 beds at Roundtree that's half empty. So I want Chief Mills to arrest people that shoot dope in that camp, and I want them to get access to meaningful rehab and reentry, which we've already spent the money on. $25 million for 64 beds, half of them empty in our community. You have the ability to direct this money these people come to me because of these failed programs at the end, and we spend $65,000 per inmate per year. Meanwhile, my daughter at Galt School can't go down to Seabright Beach with her class without being harassed by mentally ill people and drug addicts at the river mouth. I want you to do something. Thank you. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. Uh, my name is Pedro Castillo. This is my wife, Adriana. I'm here to talk about uh, concerns, issues that we have in Fulker Street. Um, our street is the end, uh, um, the street on uh, Santa Cruz right by the uh, highway, highway one. Uh, my wife uh, operates a family home daycare, which provides service for uh, 18 children. Um, she uh, we have an ongoing issue with uh, uh, transients going down the street, people with a uh, mental illness, and then, um, problems with parking, um, uh, trash on the streets, needles. Um, on the morning, I get up and go to work, and my wife has to go out and clean the street. Um, the families, they're being a deep concern. Uh, for the safety of their uh, of themselves and their kids. Um, recently, right across from our house, there is a, a program, uh, day and night stories was open, and it's been a, it hasn't been a good combination for the service that my wife provides to families and the services that, that, they, that they provide. Um, we're here to ask for your help, not just for ourselves, but for the community on the neighborhood and also for the families for which my uh, wife uh, provides service for. Um, the, uh, the families have a big concern about the, their safety. And then um, we, the families and, and are we suggesting for, if we get some help, uh, providing some uh, uh, cleanup crews that can go and clean up the street so that way all the, <clears throat> we don't have to go into the cleaning or the debris gets 
uh, push into the drain and going that into the into the uh, river bank. Uh, we will uh, like to have more uh, police patrolling more frequently, and then. Uh, um, <clears throat> I uh, we want to appreciate you know, your help and then uh, taking uh, considering our, our request. Um, <coughs> my wife is doing a uh, wonderful job to provide a great service for the community, um, providing service for the not just for the children but also for the families, uh, providing uh, parents meetings and then uh, parenting classes. And we really believe that uh, to raise a child, um, it requires a community to raise a child. And then, uh, so we're here asking for your help, and then we can all join as a community and then help us raise uh, healthy children and families. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Kevin Collins. Uh, I live in the 5th District uh, in the Santa Cruz Mountains. I came down here today because I'm preparing a response to uh, a Public Utilities Commissioner's uh, scoping memo to my adjudicatory complaint that was heard in, on November 30th. And in order to do that, I needed to read uh, Pacific Gas and Electric's uh, wildfire uh, mitigation plan, which is which you this county is a party to that proceeding at the commission in San Francisco. There's an important meeting tomorrow. Whether I can attend it, I don't know because I am uh, forced to read this painfully absurd and long document. And I I wanted you to know what's included here because none of you would have the time for this, but. Um, Pacific Gas and Electric, in the face of all their f terrible fires of 2017 and 2018, has uh, produced this uh, as their method of dealing with their fire ignitions. So in this document, there is, for instance, the announcement that they plan to uh, destroy 375,000 trees out as far as 200 feet from the power lines laterally and both, so on both sides. And uh, in regard to actually improving their infrastructure, in 2018, they uh, state in this document that they uh, upgraded 17 miles of the 25,000 miles of circuit that they run that uh, are potentially igniting wildfire. And in 2019, they announced they're gonna do 150 miles of system hardening, which at that rate would take them 200 years to, uh, quote, harden those circuits. In other words, make them less prone to igniting wildfires. So uh, I don't know whether the county joined this proceeding uh, at my suggestion, but in any case, uh, there are a number of jurisdictions uh, participating in this proceeding. It's really important that this county take an active role and uh, turn this around. The commission is such a bizarre agency. I've never come across anything like it before. All the meetings are filled with attorneys rather than engineers. So I don't think most of the people even present in the room know why these fires are being ignited, but they're there for other reasons, like billable hours, I suppose. But in any case, uh, Please take an active role in this. Uh, it's not, it's going to close out fairly soon. It's called an expedited proceeding. And there are a lot of alternatives to the, let me just put it, silly proposal that Pacific Gas and Electric has announced here. And uh, I would be happy to explain this further to any of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Nelly Cardoso. Good morning, Supervisor. My name is Nelly Cardoso. I'm here to uh, represent my, my people, um, the neighborhood. They want to, I, I make the petition for them to sign it because um, they want to park and also lower income house, two acre for lower income house. And also, I want to 
have all the harbor people make a little bit of money, they will be the first bid to get the end. So they can work very close by the, the place where they live. It will be more efficient working in the harbor. So that's what I petition I have for you guys to look at it. And please support me in this. I really need you guys deed to the harbor of the land so we can be have more efficient working with it. Thank you very much. I appreciate you your time. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Just to follow up on what my wife said, before you had, you had the petitions, um, which I think we've changed that petition maybe three or four times with uh, input from various people. Uh, we go around and try to get signatures. A lot of people would not sign that petition because they wanted low income housing and parking on that 8.3 acres. Um, before you in that, we have um, the uh, law that says that you can deed that to the port district. Uh, I think, uh, as, as I've read, it says that that piece of property has to be sold and it doesn't legally have to be sold. You can take the uh, and, and deed that actually to the port, which is something that I would like to see happen. I think Nellie feels the same way, and I think the, the uh, document that the port submitted to you requests that. Uh, there was an interesting article in the paper today. I have a copy of that, and that talks about how people uh, have problems uh, with housing, which is just everybody knows that, and and it talks about a bicycle shop and people interview, and then they look at the housing problem, and uh, what uh, what Nelly would like to see is that low income housing uh, taken be utilized for people that work at at the harbor. That includes uh, people that, that work at the Crow's Nest um, and people that work for the Port District, uh, starting at possibly the lowest uh, salaried person to have the first dibs at the low income housing. Um, it's, uh, it's, it has a lot of hurdles, that idea, but I think it has merit. Thank you. Marilyn Garrett, retired teacher and part of Wireless Radiation Alert Network. And I'm here to talk about radiation hazards. And this is a demonstration. This is an acousticom meter that detects microwave radiation from various sources. There's a sound component. The demise of the bee population is largely caused by this type of radiation. When you talk about band, broadband bandwidth means more radiation, 5G means more and different and worse radiation. At your last meeting, you passed a resolution uh, in support of Anna Eshoo's uh, bill 530 that would, that calls for a, um, a stop to the most recent rules of the FCC to roll out the 5G infrastructure. An AT&T ad recently showed that AT&T plans to have 5G in approximately 150 cities and counties in the near future, and Santa Cruz is listed. In the promotional video AT&T shows, you see the 4G antennas on the utility poles and light standards, uh, <laughs> like there are 13 in the area, that brought to us by Zach Friend in large part, on utility poles. And you see the 4G antennas, and right below it is the 5G. Um, and this is what's, what's planned. I'm calling on you to halt this 
and halt any negotiations with it. We actually need to remove the infrastructure that is causing this egregious harm of increased cancer incidence and heart problems and diabetes, a whole long list. You have been uh, provided documented information over and over again. The county should put a halt to this negotiation for any cell towers um, and 5G and a few meetings ago, I gave you a document to halt 5G on Earth and in space, an international appeal. It's essential you sign on to this. Arthur Furstenberg's been working on this as well at cellphonetaskforce.org. Thank you. We are final speaker. Before I pivot into my public, before I pivot into my public comment, I just want to remind the members of the public, and particularly uh, members of the establishment, from Jim Hart to the DA, uh, Michael Mayhem, to Carlos Palacio, to Emily Bali and Alan Timberlake. I want to be able to remind us that we're, that we're Americans and we're good-hearted. I have a right to come in here and to vent my political frustration. I want a better political life for people of color. And I want to be able to say this, I'm very thankful for the Japanese, Amer Japanese Americans that do work for the system in Santa Cruz County. I see them, I see their diligence, I see their hard work. And then to also to black Americans that do work for the, for, the, for, the, for the county. I talk to them, I dialogue with them, and I do see their, their heart and they're good Americans, just like there's good Me uh, Mexicans that do work for the system. So I'm thankful for that. And I wanna be able to right now just be able to thank uh, Gary Arnold for his leadership, for bringing, uh, the, bringing that deep state analysis Right and connecting the dots. Uh, I would want to encourage members of the public to go ahead and read newsexpo.org, uh, really good uh, uh, news source of uh, plethora of inv uh, information. But I want to be able to share with members of the public my latest book be that I'm reading. is called Killers of the Flower Moons. And the protagonists in this article, in this book, actually reminds me of Zach Friend, right? We have to learn to take out the corporate cotton out of our ears and serve the American public. Um, because, you know, it, these are trying times and we do get it. You know, we want to be able to enjoy uh, self-government where members of the public are able to come in here and weigh in on the political issue and offer the public spirited perspective. If the wrong man says the wrong thing, it's wrong. To identify with one's neighbor is the beginning of love. The day is short, the task is great. All who labor for the master of the house are welcome. And I want to be able to apologize for my attitude. Being oppressed is not nice. Ecclesiastic talks about surely oppression destroys a wise man's reason. Political oppression is real. No one calls for justice, nor do they plead for truth. They turn to empty words and speak lies. They conceive evil and bring forth the iniquity, Isaiah 59.4. So truth fail, he's, he that departs from evil makes himself pray. This is about pro-animalizing humanity. This is part of the, the prophets, what they talk about. Let's just come at it right. Where's McPherson? I'm in your district. Look out for me. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Uh, we move on to item number six, which is action on the consent agenda. These are items 13 through 53, and I'll s start with Supervisor Caput and see if he has any comments or additional direction. Yeah, I'm not uh, removing anything. The only comment I have is uh, on item 39, uh, a little bit confused. <coughs> about, uh, it's talking about <coughs> mental health. Uh, Rehabilitation Center and the cost of beds. I, uh, I can talk later and ask questions on that, but how does that money work? Uh, by raising the price per bed, how does that increase the number uh, of 
beds available. I don't know. Yeah. I'm sure um, Mimi Hall and Eric Rier are in the audience. I'm sure they'd be um, happy to explain. It's very complicated how it's do with Medi-Cal rates. And so, um, so anyway, basically we're gonna pay a higher rate to this private company, which will allow them to have more Santa Cruz residents in their facility. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it is an outside. Uh, it uh, is a private agent, facility. So a private yes. facility. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Okay, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I'd like to comment on two items. Um, item number twenty-two. Uh, along with uh, Supervisor Friend asking for uh, uh, the creation of a statewide commission on recycling. Um, for It's is really needed in this time. Uh, we have declining potential solutions uh, for our recycling markets and materials, and local governments are our partners in this, and the state passed an Integrated Waste Management Act uh, back in 1989, and we've done very well. It was, first of all, it was to be 50% uh, recyclables, and then it was 75% by 2020, and we're there, and we're moving forward. So I want to uh, uh, say congratulations to our Public Works Department and the, the county government in general for having us uh, in good position to meet these new goals. Uh, we were one of the first counties in California to uh, implement curbside recycling, if you can believe that, and to adopt a zero waste management plan in 19, 2015. So, I, uh, com I want to say congratulations to our staff and what we've done in the past and that uh, we need to be part of this call. And I, I would welcome uh, Supervisor Friend who really wanted to bring this to our attention uh, to have the state establish a recycling commission under some changing circumstances worldwide. <coughs> and to um, comment on item number 39, I am really very, very pleased to see that we're increasing our rates so we can house more local citizens in Santa Cruz County. Uh, in the future, I'd like to even see a higher percentage. Uh, this, is, this will double the number of our beds from eight to 16 in Santa Cruz County, but I'm sure that the, the need is much greater than that. I think we all know that. It's just how we can get there to accommodate to serve more people. So uh, if I could, I'd like to uh, provide additional direction for the staff to return to the Board of Supervisors in three months with a report that identifies the need for additional beds in our community and what it would take to provide those. Uh, I, I know I'm really happy with the step we're taking. I know that we need to do much more and it's gonna be a very costly venture to do that, but I just wanted to get a clear picture of what we can do in the future to serve more that are in uh, the, this need. Great, thank you. Uh, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good morning. I uh, just have a couple items that I'd like to comment on. Uh, first, on item 39, the 7th Avenue uh, uh, contract, I want to recognize uh, the staff for their inventiveness in finding a way to use this facility, which is located in our community, uh, to meet the pressing need that my colleague just talked about. Uh, figuring out a way to, to use uh, reimbursement procedures to help reduce the cost to the county um, as well as uh, increasing the access to bids so uh, families don't have to go out of the, uh, of the area in order to seek services. We don't have to send staff outside the area uh, uh, for services is a step forward. And I just uh, appreciate the hard work that the staff uh, did uh, to help make this possible. And I look forward to the additional information uh, that my colleague just spoke about. But I think this is an example of really smartly using the systems that we have uh, to meet the needs of our community. On item number 40, uh, this is the annual water resources management status report. Um, it's, an, it's an off year, so we're not doing a connecting the drops uh, event so we can herald uh, this information, but this is a great resource uh, for community members to understand what's going on in, in, uh, in, in addressing uh, water issues in our community. It really highlights a great example of partnerships that are going on between districts with the county and with the community. And I appreciate the work of uh, John Ricker and Sierra Ryan, uh, who lead our efforts to help make this happen. I look forward to this report every year. Uh, uh, lastly, uh, on item number 44, um, this is good to see the, the addition of this uh, senior mental health specialist to serve as a court clinician with the Santa Cruz County Court System, Behavioral Health Court. Um, the statistics about the success of this uh, are really great, and I'm, I'm glad to see this partnership with the courts to better meet the needs of people in the community. 
uh, that may result uh, in uh, better long-term um, outcomes for the people involved in the system rather than just more jail time. So thank you for that. Supervisor Friend. Thank you. Um, I won't add anything to item 22. I appreciate Supervisor McPherson's comments on that. I did want to just briefly say that there's about 10 commission updates on this agenda, and I wanted to take the time to thank not just the county staff that works on them, but all the community members that have signed up for these commissions, because the work really uh, does help inform the policymaking process here at the board, and it's very uh, useful to have this information and their expertise. So I wanted to take the time to thank the community that, that participates in these commissions. Great, thank you. Uh, I have two items I'd like to comment on, one with additional direction and one just to comment. Uh, with additional direction, it's item number 45, which is uh, a health services agency grant authorizations. There's two potential grants uh, that they're seeking authorization for. One is authorization for mental health wellness in, in Watsonville. Uh, I'd like to make sure or urge my colleagues that we approve that today. The second one is a pretrial felony mental health diversion grant. Uh, I'd like to continue that to our next meeting. Uh, and uh, so I can get some questions answered. The grant isn't due until April 19th, 2019, so we have some time, uh, but I'd appreciate that additional direction being included in the motion. And then the second item is item number 46, which is to accept uh, uh, Human Services Department grants for the CalWork Home Visiting uh, Program, and I just wanna thank the, the HSD staff and Ellen Timberlake who lined the our county up really well to be in this program that will get more public health nurses, nurses doing home visiting for moms and babies and improve the outcome uh, for not only the moms and babies but the entire community in the process. And this makes our uh, NFP program, a nursing partnership program, and Thrive by Three program uh, much more vibrant and sustainable into the future. And so thank you for your work in our county and statewide. I'd now uh, be open to a motion. I'll move the recommended actions with the additional direction. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Friend and a second by Leopold. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. On item number uh, seven, that was just to, this moves us to our regular agenda, which is item number seven, which is a public hearing to consider affordable housing and property disposition agreement uh, with Habitat for Humanity of Monterey Bay uh, for ha the housing successor agency site at 2340 Harper Street, Santa Cruz, and section 33433 report as outlined in the memorandum of the planning director. And I believe we have Ms. Conway here to uh, give us an overview. Yes, good morning, board members. Julie Conway, housing manager, here with Suzanne Issey, the principal planner for the housing section. Um, as you know, the affordable housing project at 2340 Harper Street was approved on January 29th. The project has now been named Rodeo Creek Court. Um, with the entitlement phase of the project complete, um, the project is now working towards its uh, submitting for its final map and its building application. The purpose of today's action is to enter into a property disposition agreement with Habitat for Humanity Monterey Bay that will define the terms of its use, the use of the property for an affordable housing purpose. Suzanne Issey will introduce the public hearing. Good morning, Chair and Board. Um, as uh, Ms. Conway mentioned, um, we are here today to review the Affordable Housing and Property Disposition Agreement as well as the Section 33433 Summary Report that's required for disposal of uh, former redevelopment agency and housing successor agency properties. Um, the property is an asset of the housing successor agency and the state had required um, by earlier direction that the county dispose of it by January 2019. Um, the county did enter into an option agreement with Habitat for the uh, transfer of the site in August of 2018, and that allows us time to now enter into the uh, affordable housing uh, property disposition agreement to complete the transfer, so it gives us a little bit of an extension of that time. Um, the board, uh, just as a reminder, considered uh, the request for proposals in 2016 for this project. Habitat was selected in May of 2017. 
and um, at that time, uh, a number of guiding principles for the contemplated project were discussed and uh, approved by the board, and we tried to really follow those guiding principles very closely in drafting um, this agreement. Uh, and the um, section 33433 report summarizes kind of the, the primary uh, points um, that are also uh, described in more detail in the agreement itself. As uh, Ms. Conway mentioned, uh, the Planning Commission held two public hearings on the entitlements for the project in November and December of 2018, and your board approved those along with the environmental review document on January 29th, I'm sorry, 29th of this year. Um, so at this time, our recommended actions are that you first hold a public hearing on the two documents here, attachments A and B. Um, Next, that you approve the uh, affordable housing property disposition agreement with Habitat as shown in attachment A. Accept and file the uh, 33433 report as shown in attachment B. And that you authorize the county administrative officer or his designee to execute the agreement and related documents necessary to complete the transfer of the property to Habitat. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Are there any questions from my colleagues? Seeing none, I'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone from the, co in the public that would like to comment? Good morning. Uh, David Foster with Habitat for Humanity. Um, if I'd like to start by thanking the Board of Supervisors for approving the subdivision application. Uh, the new project now is named um, Rodeo Creek Court. Uh, yesterday, we met with the public works uh, uh, staff and the fire chief, uh, Stephen Hall, to discuss issues related to fire safety. Some minor changes have been agreed to, including the increasing the radius and the turn as you come into the property, uh, relocating the fire hydrant so that it's closer to Harper Street, and um, marking the Harper Street roadway in front of the development uh, site as a no parking area. All of these suggestions have been incorporated or will be incorporated into the final plans and the CCNRs for the project. Um, the disposition agreement includes a careful preparation of the development timeline for the project. And we wanted to have an aggressive timeline, but we also wanted to be careful that Habitat can still follow its tradition of using community volunteers and the home buyers themselves in the construction uh, building process. I think that the timeline that we have now is a good one, and we want to, um, I did want to correct um, misinformation about Habitat's uh, performance on the seven unit Los Esteros Court project. We're actually on scale, uh, on schedule for that one. We've never come back to the county for an extension, and we're in the framing process on the sixth unit there, and about to begin construction on the final home as soon as the rainy season ends. We will fully uh, anticipate uh, meeting the project's completion date by March of 2020. So um, we're excited about moving forward with this next project and we'll, uh, we'll make it our priority to, uh, to finish it and move it forward as quickly as possible. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I'm happy to hear that uh, Habitat for Humanity has indeed met with Central Fire Chief uh, Hall to address many of the concerns that I am aware of that the neighbors have. And I really want to point out that when we do dense infill like this, that we do really need to consider the impacts on existing residents. We do need to try and follow the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan, even though it's still um, held up in environmental review. And we need to honor the people that are here now while providing housing for those in the future and really with an eye to the quality of life and the public safety that these infill projects bring. I think we need to try, even though the Sustainable Santa Cruz County Plan is not approved, I think we need to try to uphold these infill along the transportation corridors to reduce the need for infrastructure that is clearly broken in our county. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Are there any other speakers? This Chair. will be our final speaker. Chair, Mr. Huerta. thank you. Chair, Supervisors, um, Matt Huerta with the Monterey Bay Housing, uh, Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. Uh, about to also say the Monterey Bay Housing Trust Fund because uh, that's certainly one of our initiatives and um, we're really pleased to partner with the um, Habitat for Humanity uh, deal and we want to make sure that we're there as a partner long term. There may be several phases involved. There's tons of funding that's needed, volunteers, a lot of, of effort here to make sure that the, the homes are, are affordable at the levels that, that are required here as part of the, this uh, partnership with the county and the redevelopment uh, funds and, and um, history of the site, as you've mentioned before. So it's, it's in very intense, and um, again, we in, intend on making sure that uh, we're there for the short-term financing if they need that, um, and then also to help facilitate any additional soft financing uh, for the home buyers down the line. And uh, this should be uh, a, a very in, um, important and uh, again, deeply targeted development for the community. Thank you. Thank you. That closes. Ms. Garrett. Having been present at the meeting uh, on the 29th to approve this, I uh, was really taken aback by the approval after hearing the residents' um, um, complaints about the negative impacts to this whole uh, street. Um, narrow and used supervisor Leopold spoke of how you'd walk that street. Um, it just did not seem appropriate and I feel like we're kind of um, living in myths here, like this is affordable housing when there's so many people who don't have any housing. It's, you know, I keep thinking of that bumper sticker, it'll be a great day when the schools have all the money they need and the Air Force has to have a bake sale to buy a bomber. That goes for housing, it goes for parks, what we could do with over a half of our tax dollars going towards the military budget. I understand there are what do you call it, alliances of county and state governments. And I remember hearing of a group share the wealth campaign. I'd like to see you advocating for redirecting money that is going in a gargantuan way to the Ms. military Ms. Garrett, industrial please, complex please to your housing. Time you have to I speak am to the talking about, about this in context, and I noticed you only interrupt the 77-year-old woman who tries to put things in context and speak for the well-being of the community. I would like to see real affordable housing for everyone, and this project, um, unfortunately, uh, doesn't meet the criteria in my estimation. The other thing I wanted to say when I heard that uh, one of these units is going for veterans, um, uh, sure, veterans need help, but people who resist these wars need help too. Thank you. Thank you. That closes the public comment, uh, and I'll bring it back to the board for action. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Motion by friend, second by McPherson. Mr. Leopold. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Uh, um, my views on the size of this project are well known, so I won't go over that. Uh, I'm going to be supporting this uh, disposition of, uh, of this land uh, to habitat. Uh, but I hope that now that Habitat is working uh, as uh, agent of the county, uh, with county land, um, that uh, we see the, the purpose of it, but that you begin to actually working with the neighborhood in a meaningful and constructive way, which you haven't shown so far. And this is an opportunity as you move into the construction phase of your project to work more closely with the, uh, with the neighborhood to be able to meet the, the needs and concerns they have uh, and be uh, aware um, that uh, you have an impact on the community and then as a neighbor you have a responsibility to the other people who live there. So, uh, and I'll just briefly say 
this, as, I, as we mentioned before, this, habit, this project conforms the general plan, the neighborhood plan, setback requirements, uh, of everything else, and it pr provides 11 affordable units uh, in our community, which are desperately, desperately needed, and I'll thank uh, Habitat for their work to bring this project forward in, um, in alignment with the county's policies and goals. So uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, that passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we're now moving on to item number eight. This is to consider a report on the focused intervention team, the FIT team uh, pilot to address high frequency criminal offenders and direct staff to return on September, uh, in September 2019 with an update as, outline, as outlined in the memorandum of the, uh, of the CAO, Sheriff Corner, and Director of Health Services. I wanted to uh, start the presentation today by uh, thanking staff for their efforts on this project. Uh, there has been uh, quite a bit of work uh, put into um, developing this program. Uh, any startup is difficult, uh, but the, the goals of this program, which are dealing with a population that has many needs, are have been very difficult. And so I especially want to thank uh, <coughs> Sheriff Hart and under uh, Sheriff Craig Wilson for their work on this and their commitment. Um, not often you'll find uh, law enforcement officials who have been so uh, cooperative and willing to work with this population that we, we will be talking with shortly. I really do appreciate it, uh, Sheriff Hart. Also, Health Services Agency, Eric Riera, Pam Rogers-Wyman, and Mimi Hall, uh, they've worked uh, many long hours on developing this program. And from my own office, Elisa Benson and Sven Stafford have taken a lead, up, lead on this as well. So thank you, staff, for this. And uh, now we'll go into our presentation. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Uh, my name is Elisa Benson with the CAO's office. I'm going to be uh, providing sort of the overview uh, to the present presentation today. Um, our purpose today is to provide a report on the FIT pilot program launch and receive additional board direction. Our presenters are Jer our Sheriff Jim Hart and BHD uh, Director Eric Riera. We also have Craig Wilson and Pam Rogers-Wyman here uh, if we have more specific questions around operational de details in the program's launch. I will be providing a very brief introduction and then really handing uh, the, the clicker over to uh, Sheriff Hart and, and Eric to go into the details of the program, how it's functioning in our first three weeks of operation and where we plan to go from here. So very quickly, a, a bit of orientation more for the wa watching public. Um, during our June uh, 2018 budget hearings, uh, we asked our departments to talk about any critical unmet needs as we discussed moving into the future. Sheriff Hart uh, and, uh, and Eric both identified uh, critical unmet need in the area of um, men, folks in our community, generally high frequency criminal offenders who were exhibiting, acting out in threatening manners, uh, in a real threatening and aggressive manner and don't appear to want help. Uh, so with that sort of opening description, uh, the board asked Carlos to come back, the CAO to come back later with, uh, with some proposals to, ad to address those needs, among, among many other critical needs, and a funding mechanism to do so. And that's where we had the proposal for Measure G. As you all well know, that measure was successfully approved by the voters in November of last year at 66%. And that new funding allowed us to start some different programs, um, including additional shelter dollars and, and investments in our parks. So the FIT pilot, the focused intervention team, really is a, a, a shared and joint initiative between the sheriff and HSA's behavioral health division to enhance community safety and really uh, increase our, our success in bringing uh, high frequently criminal offenders um, into treatment. This, I'm gonna talk a little bit about where, where the, the basis we're building this program on. And this is really a history of collaboration between the sheriff and HSA in particular um, around addressing um, the need for partnership between law enforcement and behavioral health. 
And where this started was with the introduction of our crisis, crisis intervention team. Again, a little bit of background for the watching public. Crisis intervention teams is a methodology that's, gosh, started in the late 80s out of Memphis, Tennessee, and it, it uh, after a critical and tragic event in their community, and it really in initiated a program of training of law enforcement, um, law enforcement, and actually many first responders, and how to better respond in the field to situations involving behavioral health and mental in illness in particular. And it really is the start of where that that. Um, team approach between law enforcement and behavioral health began. Here in the County of Santa Cruz, that nationally recognized model was customized between the sheriff and behavioral health for a specific cur curriculum, and that training of our um, law enforcement uh, officers was then combined with our mental health liaison program. So we don't just have a CIT training approach, we have a CIT program in this community and, and it, it's extended both to um, City of Santa Cruz, the mental health liaisons there, as well as Watsonville and then within the unincorporated area. As we talk about FIT, the pilot, it is really building off that, what I would call reactive crisis model and taking it to the next level. Um, it, it takes this generalized approach and takes it into a proactive and intensive focused delivery approach with um, a segment of the population that has demonstrated being resistant to treatment and change. Um, and it, as you learn about the program today, I think you'll, the level of integration between law enforcement and behavioral health from start to finish in the program that we envision is quite remarkable. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Sheriff Hart. <clears throat> Thank you. Good morning, board. Jim Hart, Sheriff Corner. And I just want to give you a little bit of a background on the FIT program. This is a, a uniquely designed program between multiple agencies, and that's Sheriff, Behavioral Health, and CAO. And it involves three police officers, and that's a, a one sheriff sergeant and two deputy sheriffs, three clinicians from, from mental health, and an administrative aide who is collecting data. And it involves intense field supervision with, with this team when people are out of custody, and it involves interventions at the jail as these people cycle through the jail system. Uh, we're, we're working in a fast-track custody assessment service and treatment plan, and what I mean by that is, is that oftentimes when people come into the jail, they, uh, there's a process, they have to, uh, go through a classification process, they have to get housed, and it takes a while to get them into any level of, a, of, of treatment or, or work with clinicians, whereas uh, group, uh, this group of people are fast-tracked right into a housing unit and services are delivered within the first 12 to 24 hours of them being admitted into the county jail. Uh, the court system is determining their custody stab status at arraignment, and so we will be holding these people in custody until arraignment, and then it's up to the court to, to determine uh, where they go from there. And we've done a lot of community engagement, and there's been a lot of participation, participation from community groups. Uh, from the very start, when we started the Measure G campaign, I know that I've, I've been to many, many presentations and community uh, groups, uh, uh, talks with community groups as well as individual business owners and, and people. And so uh, we've, we've received a lot of input from key stakeholders uh, and I think we've been able to design the program around that. And then we will have an R, uh, we'll have independent program evaluation with applied survey research. They're on contract to evaluate this program. So I mentioned outreach. These are just some of the groups that, that we have met with. And, uh, and then during the Measure G campaign where we made very specific promises about what we were gonna do, we met with a lot more groups than what's mentioned in here. And we've taken the time to hear from the community and hear their concerns. Uh, and people have asked us, and the, when I say us, I mean the county to get involved at, at a higher level. Uh, so this is a broad list of people of organizations that we have met with, and uh, there's been a lot of support from these groups that are mentioned in here. I just want to give you an example client that is currently on our FIT caseload. And this, this person is in no way an outlier. We have two people who have 
uh, at least 200 police and deputy contacts. And so this person is, is uh, just, just an example of the kind of resources that are being uh, used out there when, when dealing with people who just won't get help. And so as you can see, the, the, this person was arrested 43 times in 2018. Uh, he's had 11 arrests in the last 90 days, 21 citations for local ordinances and municipal code violations, 54 stay away orders from locations around Santa Cruz. Uh, many callers, uh, when they call our dispatch center to report this person, they, they describe the person as being belligerent, yelling, refusing to leave, challenging to fight, et cetera. Uh, recent arrests are mostly around substance use, drugs, alcohol, and then also some associated crimes, resisting arrest and trespassing. Uh, the offender is no longer welcome at the recovery center, which as you know, it's, a, it's a, a, a place where we divert people who have substance use problems. Instead of going to jail, we try to get them to the recovery center. But this person's behavior is so outrageous that not even the recovery center is able to manage him, so the person has to go to county jail. And then this offender is also absconded from court order treatment. And in, in many ways, this is just an example of, of the way that these people are calling out for help. When they have this many contacts with sheriff, police, EMS, fire, uh, you can imagine the level of resource that it takes us to manage this one person uh, when, when they are out of custody. As far as uh, referrals and capacity, uh, you can see on there that we have three or more law enforcement contacts in the last 90 days. Um, and then th there's some other information on there. But what I really want to be clear on is that it's, it's way too early to talk about results. We're only on week three of, of this program. And we're going to come back to you in September and, and uh, give you some, uh, an update on six or seven months of information. Uh, but for the first three weeks, there's some very positive early indicators that have occurred. And I just want to share that with you. What we're finding uh, is we're getting a lot of referrals from police, from deputies, from, uh, from the community, from business owners. So we've received 60 referrals already in the first three weeks of this program. We've accepted 20 people onto the FIT client list. <laughs> What we're finding with those 60 people is that nine of the, um, excuse me, of those 20 people, nine of the 20 people are involved in multiple jurisdictions. So they're in the city of Santa Cruz, they're in Felton, they're in Live Oak, Soquel, Aptos, but they go in and out of jurisdictions. We've uh, found that all 20 are homeless, all have substance use disorder, um, and that we've already been able to place two of these people into programs and we have an additional person who's pending of, of the 20 people that are on the, the FIT list. So that's the information I wanted to share with you and I'm going to turn this over to Eric. Thank you, Sheriff Hart. Good morning, board. I'm Eric Riera. I'm the County Behavioral Health Director. I'm going to be talking a little bit about our engagement through behavioral health in the FIT program. Um, we currently provide a wide spectrum of services integrated within our local criminal justice system, and FIT is an extension of those various programs. Our FIT pilot will leverage the integration with law enforcement and also enhance current mental health liaison programs that we have with multiple jurisdictions, including the Sheriff's Office, the Santa Cruz Police Department, and the Watsonville Police Department. The different models that our involvement is based on is, as Elisa mentioned earlier, this crisis intervention team model, the CIT model, where we actually embed clinical staff who work hand in hand with law enforcement in the community, a collaborative engagement model for individuals with behavioral health conditions, and we also include very intensive case management and access to treatment services in the community. Our treatment services are based on a needs assessment that's conducted both in the field and at the jail, as well as conditions that are stipulated by the court for the individual in the FIT program. These programs that we provide access to include outpatient behavioral health services, residential treatment, both mental health and substance use disorder residential, 
housing supports, psychiatry services, community-based treatment, including case management using evidence-based practices of motivational interviewing, trauma-informed care, and cognitive behavioral therapy. We've established a new day program called Pathways to Wellness, which is available seven days per week. And we also have contracted with the River Street Shelter for two beds for fit participants. We also place a heavy emphasis on coordination with the courts, as well as linkages to the two specialty courts, the PACT Specialty Court and the Behavioral Health Court. From the behavioral health perspective, as well as from a law enforcement perspective, we're really looking at the use of in-custody services as an intervention to be able to deliver services to this group of individuals. It's an engagement strategy where we're disrupting public safety issues of aggressive and threatening actions in the community that require law enforcement response. We're providing an in-field assessment for the mental health condition or substance use disorder to ensure that these individuals have access to those services at the time of our first contact with them in the community. We believe that this will be a very stabilizing approach when paired with 24-7 medical and pharmacological oversight at the jail. And for many of these individuals, we're potentially engaging them for the first time in treatment intervention services. Our initial assumption in designing the program is that in, in custody um, services will be for three to five days before we look for a return back to the community. And we're also placing a heavy emphasis on rapidly enrolling those individuals in services. As Sheriff Hart has mentioned, we've contracted with Applied Survey Research, ASR, to do an evaluation of the program. And we've modeled our program evaluation criteria against the Stepping Up Initiative, their pre and post measures. We have various domain areas of system integration and coordination, access to care, there are a number of criminal justice measures, quality of life, and community measures that are built into the evaluation process. And in terms of our next step for the evaluation, we will be building baseline data on the program and the program participants, since this is a new program and we're still learning um, in terms of the specific needs of this population and then establishing specific performance goals for the program based on that baseline data and our first quarter of operational experience. There are a number of program risks that we've identified early on. Um, a lack of shelter and affordable housing threatens the stability in the community for all of our participants. We don't have access to any additional housing options, and as Sheriff Hart mentioned, our current FIT program participants are all homeless. We have risks around treatment capacity, particularly substance use disorder, residential treatment, and withdrawal management treatment in the community. We're finding early on that many of the initial referrals are for individuals who have very complex medical conditions as well, including acquired brain disorders and difficulty measuring community perception of safety and harm reduction benefits. We're still working with our evaluator to develop some strategies around that. Okay, so it's back to me. Uh, we, as mentioned, we ha are planning to return to the board with a report on our baseline data and how, uh, how the operations are going in September 2019. On the slide, there's a, a quick summary again of the program, and I would want to just summarize our goals for the program. It really is to reduce criminal activity and, and associated community impacts, increase linkage to services, and uh, increase treatment compliance and success for the individuals in the program. With that, we would welcome your questions. And do we have any questions? Supervisor McPherson. Um, I'm really pleased to see this uh, focus intervention team uh, being launched, and I know it al already has a number of participants, as was mentioned. Um, 
This was a, a critical part of Measure G that was passed by voters uh, last November, and our, I know that our community supports this c type of collaboration between the agencies of law enforcement and health services. I think it's a tremendous example of how we can get our, some of our departments to work together, and they're very willing to do that, and they're excited about doing that. Uh, and this, this pathway um, into this program uh, really uh, is through law enforcement, so brief periods of incarceration are, um, will naturally be part of it. I know that when I was on the campaign trail supporting uh, or advocating or explaining, I should say, Measure G, that uh, said this is uh, really uh, an efficient way to address some of our most critical needs in law enforcement and some of the so-called uh, troubled troublemakers in our, in our community. But the idea is to work with some of um, the most challenging people in the community and move them from the jail uh, into substance abuse and mental health treatment and hopefully into housing. Uh, we have some big problems here. We know uh, there are some folks that we've seen time and time again that uh, are in disorderly conduct out there. And I think this is a reasonable and a, a sensible way to go about it in a collaborative effort. And I really want to uh, uh, say uh, congratulations to the sheriff, the behavioral, behavioral services, and the CAO's office for doing this. This is one of the most pressing needs that uh, our community at large wants us to address, and I'm glad we're going at it. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Uh, <coughs> I'm uh, glad to see we're addressing a big problem that's probably facing a lot of people. and. Uh, not only our community, but everywhere. Uh, <clears throat> maybe uh, quickly, it is a pilot program, and it's what, matching funds from where, and how long will those matching funds last? Let me speak to that. Um, the, this, this program is entirely funded from the general fund and the additional resources that Measure G provided. That so it, so it is It is a county-funded program. Okay. Although the, some of the programs will, are that, funded through um, uh, existing programs uh, in the health services agency. So when we refer folks to mental health treatment, substance use disorder, those are some existing federal and state funds as well that we are leveraging. Okay. And that will, that's what we have now and will continue? Yes, okay. it will. And then uh, <clears throat> how, how does it work? Uh, we have... Uh, let's say uh, three, uh, it says peace officers, those would be uh, sheriff deputies we're talking about, or also they would work with the city of Santa Cruz, Watsonville, and Scotts Valley, Capitola, city police also. So there's a supervisor, so a sheriff sergeant and two deputies along with three mental health clinicians and an administrative aide, and so they work as a county team uh, in the unincorporated area as well as the four cities. Okay. Now, if, if there's a call or there's a need, a, a clinician would not go out on, on his own or her own? Yeah, there's, there's been a little bit of confusion on this issue. These, these people, this team is not a first responder team. This team is working off of a caseload and a client list. And so if, if Santa Cruz PD has a call for service, uh, Santa Cruz PD is going to handle that. The, our people aren't going to jump in and, and take that, case, that call if they're in the area. Now, of course, if there's violence or a, a, a case that more police are needed, of course our people are going to help. But on the day-to-day -day routine calls, <coughs> our people are working on a very specific client list in the county as well as in the cities. Okay. And uh, in the case of uh, one person was arrested, what, 48 ti 43 times in 2018? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, just to give me an example, how, how is this going to help uh, him, I'm assuming? Yeah, so if, if this person can be convinced to change their behavior and go into treatment for, for whatever's bothering them, whether it's substance use, uh, you know, whether it's drugs and alcohol is primarily is what's, what's fueling most of this behavior. Um, but if we can convince that person to seek treatment, then the behavior could potentially stop, and, and that's the hope of, the, of this group. Many of these people have been offered treatment, but they refuse it. Some have had court order treatment, and they uh, abscond or they leave the treatment center. And there's been very little accountability for them uh, in the past when, when they do that, and their behaviors continue out on the street. And so uh, by using the jail as a resource, 
uh, we're hoping that through our three clinicians and our and our involved staff that we can convince the people to receive treatment. Okay, and uh, again, I think it's great we're we're actually focusing on this. Uh, I'm just trying to get a picture of how it works in the sense of uh, we, we do have an assessment team right now, and uh, that uh, the current assessment of somebody that needs all this treatment and everything. Uh, how does that, how's that gonna work with all this, I guess? Part of the model is pairing a behavioral health clinician with the sheriff's deputy in the field so that when we're having contact with these individuals, we're doing an assessment in the field at that time of the individual so that they're not having to come into the office or one of our clinic sites to get that assessment done. We're doing it with law enforcement in the field, very similar to what we do with our law enforcement liaison program. You bet. And uh, one last thing, uh, again, with uh, someone, the, the difference now with a, a person that was arrested 40 plus times, uh, now they're, we're, we're trying to put, uh, place that person, but in the, uh, what we're proposing is is that person free to leave or uh, that person can still say I'm not going to go to treatment? And if they do go to treatment, uh, are they going to be able to just walk away? Well, they're certainly free to decline treatment. Um, they're not free to walk away while they're in custody. Um, and the court certainly has oversight in terms of ordering the person to follow a specific plan following their release from the jail. Um, but we're hoping that by using these various evidence-based practices, such as motivational interviewing, we're able to better meet the person where they are. They've had some time to sober up at the jail and have a discussion with us about what we see their needs are and what they see their needs are. And we're hoping that we have a chance to engage them in a different way that we wouldn't have if we were trying to work with them in the field and they were intoxicated, for example. And uh, that's why basically uh, I'm for the program. I think it's wonderful uh, where they're gonna get more attention, more professional help. And uh, 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 it's something we need to do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation and thank you for the thoughtfulness in putting together the, pro uh, the program. Um, I've spent a lot of time with staff uh, asking a lot of questions um, about this to better understand it. Uh, we invested in a program um, focused on the downtown a couple years back and after evaluation we found that the, the, the one metric that we could uh, point to was that people spent more days in jail. Um, and we decided to redesign the program uh, to better meet the needs of the community because um, that, that doesn't break a cycle, that just provides a way station. And so when I s see that on, in this program we're gonna do some flash incarceration uh, uh, with folks to get them uh, help with clinicians inside the jail, um, I'm wondering, um, uh, Mr. Riera, if, uh, talk a little bit more the the case that the sheriff brought up about a person who is clearly a repeat offender also has been uh, placed in a treatment program um, but hasn't been able to complete that um, uh, and and has been resistant to our other sort of less intensive uh, center like the sobering center what might we expect to, to happen with the, that, that person once inside uh, the jail for the three to five days? I think to begin with, there'll be a new assessment of the individual and a treatment plan developed with the individual in terms of next steps. We'll be working with them to get them to the point of um, treatment readiness, um, and that can take different periods of time depending on where a particular person is at relative to their substance use, for example. And one of the key differences is that when they return back to the community, we'll be doing proactive engagement with law enforcement in the community. So unlike the current model where someone might be released 
and they're on their own in the community and we hope that they come into services as, as have been set up for them. They'll actually have frequent contacts with a sheriff's deputy and a mental health clinician who's working with them to help remind them of the plan that was developed and the importance of engaging in that plan. And already we've, we've kind of modified our approach in the community where the sheriff's deputy may provide transportation to a residential program with the fit participant to make sure that they get there for their first day. So it's that intensive community engagement that's done on a proactive basis um, that I think is gonna be a key difference and likely something that will contribute to the success of the program. Um, and, and do we have uh, researchers that says this flash incarceration model uh, is, has been successful in other programs with people who are resistant uh, to treatment? There is research speaking to the effectiveness of disrupting certain behaviors in the community using that model, but for us, really the key the key ingredient to a, a short incarceration is being able to work with the individual when they're sober. Because um, 100% of the referrals currently have uh, an active substance use disorder. And it's very, very hard, if not impossible, to engage someone in the community if they're under the influence. So giving that chance for someone to sober up after a day or two and then work with them, we're, we believe that we'll have more success <laughs> that way than trying to do in the community when they're actively using. Sure, uh, that makes sense. And you mentioned something about uh, uh, brain injuries and what role do you think that's gonna play with the population that, that, we're, that we hope to be serving through this program? I think when we were developing the program model, there were some suspicions around um, a number of, of the residents in the community who might have an actual brain injury um, that was contributing to their behavior, either through long-term substance use or multiple accidents in the community, such as falls involving the head and head trauma. And it makes it very difficult to have success using a traditional behavioral health intervention with them. Um, it is a population that has a lot of difficulty accessing services right now. Um, putting aside the whole homeless issue um, because the system within the state of California isn't designed to necessarily serve an adult who's had a traumatic brain injury after the age of 18. There is some legislation looking at a study committee um, for this specific population and we are hoping to help inform that study committee but also potentially be a pilot site for the state to develop some programming specific to this population. Is there an assessment that we can do when someone's in the jail to assess for a brain injury that doesn't require an MRI or something uh, as intensive as that? There is, and we have access to psychologists who can do neuropsych testing and help make that determination or help inform that determination. Um, so, and you talked of that uh, in your presentation that for some of these people, this will be the first time that there's an intervention. But as the case, uh, I'm not sure where we've, what we've seen so far with the uh, 20 people who are in there, whether they are really people who haven't um, had the opportunity or haven't been um, suggested for uh, treatment in the past and these are really first time intervention. The, 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 the example obviously wasn't somebody, but I'm wondering what we're seeing so far. Well, there is one person, for example, who was recently engaged in the program that has been in the community for a while, um, but we've had no contact with this person. Um, so we have no history of, of working with this individual, but um, it's clear that they likely have some needs that we can provide assistance to them for. So they would be someone new to the system and new to services that we haven't had the chance to offer to yet.
Um, I was interested to note in the in your write up about act, connecting people with existing services, everything from CalFresh uh, uh, to healthcare services, and um, w do we see this the the safety net clinics playing a role of being helpful in addressing the needs of the people who will be in this program? Absolutely, and I think we can expect that the majority of individuals that we come into contact with um, likely aren't accessing primary care services either. Um, and a significant portion will likely have significant medical issues that haven't been addressed historically. So that's, that's a key priority is to also provide access to those critical health care services for this group. And have we reached out to those safety net clinics or the HIP Council? the Health Improvement Partnership Council to talk about what role that they could play with uh, uh, these clients? Not specifically. We've done some community presentations that have involved them, but not discussed yet um, how they can be actively engaged in serving this group. As we get more information and we figure out better in terms of what the needs of this population are, we'll be sure to connect with those safety net clinics to help us. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, I'm, I'm, the uh, I'm trying to remember what her exact title is. Uh, the uh, the courts uh, coordinator who does all the specialty courts uh, coordinator uh, recently received a grant to do this uh, system intercept mapping, which is uh, one of the things uh, that the Stepping Up Initiative recommends that that communities do to identify where there might be gaps in services or to how to strengthen services. Um, that process will be running in parallel to the startup of this program, um, uh, but it might provide great information about how this program could better effectively meet the needs of the community. Are you open to making changes in the program based on that, uh, on that mapping exercise, which I think county staff will be involved in um, to better meet the needs of the community? Absolutely, and we actually participated in providing support for that application. So um, I think, as you know from our history, we're very open to taking a critical look at all of our programs and strongly emphasizing any way that we can improve them for the future. And this will be no exception. Um, so the uh, one of the key parts of this, which um, is beyond the scope of this program, but seems to me plays a critical role in the success of this program. You brought up um, uh, two things. One is, is that all 20 people who are currently in the program are homeless. And one slide referred to housing support. Um, what kind of housing support can we offer those folks uh, as, uh, through this program? Well, we will work with them as we do all of our other clients and work to get them into stable, supported housing in the community. Um, if we're successful with that, we'll continue our engagement and our involvement with them in their apartment or their particular housing program that we can connect them to. Yeah, it's a big challenge. It if is. I, if just looking at 20 people, finding housing for 20 people is going gonna, is gonna to be a big challenge. So but it seems critical uh, if we want people to address their substance use or even behavioral health issues. Our housing first strategy is say, get that roof over that person's head. Absolutely. Um, but we, we don't all, as I say, it's beyond the scope of what this program can do, but it seems to play a critical role um, in whether we'll be uh, successful in this effort. It's gonna be very hard for folks to maintain their sobriety in the community if they're still living on the street, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be, you know, I, uh, uh, I've gone round and round uh, with staff, uh, you included, about trying to figure out some clear metrics about uh, um, uh, how we would measure success in this program. And uh, I will uh, be uh, asking us to take a look at, you know, where, whether we're getting people into treatment, how long people are spending in jail, and whether they're decrease in criminal activity is directly related to the number of days spent in jails. That's what we found in the previous evaluation. Um, and we said we didn't think that was a good strategy. And so uh, I'm hoping that we have a stronger um, set of uh, goals that are measurable um, that we can look at because as we invest a million dollars into a program, 
it would it, it would be good to know that 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 we are making an earnest attempt. I think this is a committed attempt from people who really care uh, about meeting the needs of the community. Um, and I think we should be clear about what we might actually expect in part of this program and have some uh, measurable outcomes that we can show that the investment of the public funds uh, is making a difference in the community. We absolutely agree. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll be brief because I know people have been waiting patiently uh, to speak on this and other items. Very briefly, I just want to thank Sheriff Hart and um, HSA staff for bringing this together. It's a commitment that we made, and the CAO staff. Uh, it's a commitment that we, many of us went out to the community and made for what is the most single most important issue facing uh, my district, which is uh, real fear and a lack of public safety in our public spaces. Um, and so the fact that we were able to keep our promise and get this program up and going and already uh, already showing results. I've already heard from a constituent who was being terrorized in his neighborhood and there's been a fit client and the intervention has worked uh, to reduce it. Um, that early indication of success gives me a lot of hope. And I'll just say finally, um, that I, I'm looking, I look forward to seeing all of ASR's metrics. The primary metric for whether uh, this program works is a reduction in criminal activity by these clients. Um, in my experience, by the time somebody is cited or arrested, uh, there's already been dozens of people impacted by, uh, by that behavior. People have been victimized, they've been terrorized, they've been repulsed uh, as they're just trying to live their lives or, or open their business or work in a business. And so um, focusing on these efforts so that we have fewer of those uh, events and fewer of those arrests will be the primary way that, um, that I think this program uh, should be judged and we should be looking as a, at the model of success. Um, so now I'm gonna open it up to the, to the public to speak. Uh, anyone who's interested, please line up if you're able, uh, and two minutes per person, please. As a former jail nurse, I'd like to offer some more suggestions. Um, first of all, if you want to talk about metrics, let's talk about medication being on board within 24 hours of coming into the system. Right now you contract with California Forensic Medical Group, which is a private for-profit corporation. Inmates are not getting their medication, they're not getting their psych medication or their medical medication within 24 hours of entry into the jail system. Your sobering center cannot offer meaningful detox to these hardcore clients as evidenced by your own program. I'm really excited for this program, but my suggestion is that you actually put nursing care behind it, meaning the nurse that actually administers the medication follows through with the client and actually provides mental health nursing and referral. So if you wanna actually see if the program is working, you need to look at medication refusals. You need to look at did this client receive their psych medication, their medical medication within the first 24 hours of accessing the system. Referrals, follow up on the referral. We have no referral system at the jail to actually connect. Are these people actually followed through with? We don't have electronic health records. You cannot follow through. You have no idea what medication these people are even taking, only based on what they tell you when they come into the system, okay? Three to five days, not enough time. I'm gonna tell you right now, this is why these hardcore people end up in my prison on five-point restraints and on conserved status, okay? These policies are already out there. Best practices are already being followed. We're under federal receivership for medical and psych care for a reason. The jail is old prison, okay? We don't need to reinvent the wheel. You need to listen to the people who work in these areas to understand you need to get rid of private for-profit CFMG. You need to actually put the money in nursing care. Nursing, registered nurse. Not medical assistance, LVN. Good morning, Michael Archer. I um, live here in Santa Cruz. I came to Santa Cruz in 1980, was put in a group home. So I grew up in the community here with Jim. In 91, I had the unfortunate task of Jim uh, taking me in on a $2,500 warrant. He weren't able to let me go, I tried. Um, and that was the final time I needed the way station to uh, come to grips. And so I hear about this program and I go, this program's for me. 
I was from a high risk background. I made high risk decisions. And, and um, from the surface, it sounds like you're, and if I didn't make better decisions, which fortunately I did, I would be possibly that person in the street waving the some, you know, raising hell. But I'm not, and I'm just thankful to hear that, Jim, you put together a program that is reaching out to people that could have been me compassionately, treating me like a human being, while at the same time looking out for the community. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, Benjamin Kogan, and um, yes, this is an interesting topic, so I want to acknowledge you guys for um, divulging into it, and um, I want to also uh, consider that these are humans, and these are their freedoms and their rights, and that's what we're talking about, and in being incarcerated, and the whole thing starts because drugs are criminal and illegal, and what that does is it creates that they cannot get open help open discussion. They cannot go to these programs pre being um, incarcerated. So there has to be a problem, then the government and this has created the solution. And then we have the needle exchange program, which kind of sets the stage up for uh, this kind of thing to happen. They get the free needles, they go on the street, they're doing this and all that. Homelessness has been an issue. It's talked in everything. One of the ideas I was going to say earlier was maybe we can find a parcel of land where we can actually designate people to go. They can sign on saying they will not do drugs on this property. We can have a group of volunteers. We can even have the police chaperone and monitor to make sure that there's no, um, there's no drugs on the property. And they can sleep in their cars or they can do whatever to get back on their feet. We can even have like volunteer organizations like Food Not Bombs feed, feed them food and stuff like that and really help people get on their feet um, and, and, and have this dialogue where it's not a, a criminal thing because otherwise they're in the shadows, they can't come open uh, and there's no places for them to go. Uh, and then uh, even just having like, you know, if someone's using, they're going to be a public disturbance, they'll be disturbing the peace or something like that. And just if it's known that, you know, if you're doing, let's say you're doing heroin, if you know you're going to be in a, you know, like you're going to be seven days with food, water, shelter, and detoxing, you might not be a public d disturbance. You might actually be very peaceful because you don't want to go through that process. So these are all considerations. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. As a taxpayer, um, I, I want to know about the cost of this program that Measure G will be funding. I heard a figure of $1 million, but I haven't heard any other figure about cost. I'm happy to hear that taxpayer dollars will be going to this, and I hope there's this rigorous conversation about supporting FIRE, which Measure G also is supposed to support. I uh, don't see any inclusion in here about peer support, and I want that included. I want this gen people like this gentleman that, that knows what the street life is like and has come through on the other side of it. Those people have the best chances of getting through to the people who are hooked into drugs and are spiraling downward because they've been there. Clinicians are great, but they've never been there. And for, in order for a person to agree to go through treatment, they have to want to go through treatment. And to have peer, su peer counseling, peer support, be it through the veterans, I'm suspecting a lot of them are veterans, we've got to include that as a key component in this program. We've got to listen to people like this nurse that's come and really pay attention to what she's saying. That's key information from the trenches that you need to incorporate. Um, and then the homelessness issue. We can keep them in jail, all right, and then we return them to the community, but what is the community? And Supervisor Leopold, you have handily said it, we put them back on the streets, in, in essence, back to where they were, with no support, and, and frankly, uh, probably with a big mistrust of the system, so the sheriff's gonna pull up and take them to their treatment. Why don't we get a, a small community of tough sheds for these people? It's 20 people. We could do that with tough sheds where they would be in a, in a similar community with themselves, with peers. It would be monitored. They would have a roof over their head. Those are $5,000 a unit. It's working well in Oakland, and we should do it here. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Richard Lewis, Great Panther. It's not easy to pass on the wisdom. 
really appreciate this particular model, but there's other targeted within the criminal justice. And she spoke of the veterans. Uh, I, I know you're not going to answer, but is that part of the strategic planning of staff of this targeted population? And if not, where is the bridge to the resources of the state that really care about services to our veterans? I can share a blueprint. We call it Mikey uh, Young's blueprint. Mikey is a Marine. He's out in the community. He's my partner in the sense of his, his garage is just starting as an individual. That's the kind of PhD that she was speaking of, of having peers involved in the program. I'll do my best to share that, uh, which I think I may have shared a chip. The San Diego, everybody that's anybody, funded by the Chamber of Commerce, came up with a blueprint for veterans. Please take a look at it. And thank you for what you've done, because we've got to do the same thing in prevention, targeting that kid that's on the path in probation to prison and jail, the same time that you who are supervisors and staff have put into this high need of inebriation, we've got to do to change and create a new path. <coughs> Again, hope that we can come up with that fight crime invest in kids that you speak of knowing and show that this county, we can do something different. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Supervisors. My name is Chip. I'm the executive of the Downtown Association, and I want to uh, offer my support and enthusiasm for this program. Um, I'm encouraged by the community support, as illustrated by the, the voters in Measure G, and I'm, I'm I am hopeful for this program. I'm not surprised uh, to learn that the initial participants are all uh, dealing with substance uh, use disorder and are all, all experiencing homelessness. And I think both of those um, conditions uh, require casework and aggressive casework to, to make any kind of change in that. So I think coupling the enforcement uh, that we have with the sheriff and the, and the aggressive casework uh, will be very helpful, I, I hope. I think I see a lot of my colleagues around that in other communities who uh, have similar programs and they seem to be very effective. I do want to underscore the, the risks that were pointed out in the, the lack of capacity in, in housing and substance use disorder treatment uh, spaces is, is very significant and I think uh, I, I'm concerned that those barriers will um, be indicators that this program's not as, success, as successful as it could be. Um, so I, I hope we can, as a community, double down and create more resources for, uh, to house people and to provide support for people as we are uh, building more cases and understanding what people need. So I appreciate the, all the support this program's getting, and I'm really encouraged to see the, uh, the metrics and, and tweak it as we need to as it goes along. Thanks so much. Hello, thank you everyone. My name is Yasmina Porter and I represent the Tannery campus. Um, I wasn't planning to speak now, but it, it does seem relevant. I came for the homelessness issue, but it's definitely relevant. So I just wanted to say thank you for, for creating this. I'm very hopeful about it. Um, and also I'm hoping that the county will put more resources towards uh, homeless abatement and treatment. And specifically, I wanna just um, say a word to appreciate the camp that was the River Street camp that was really close to my home. Right now, we feel under siege with what we are dealing with in terms of, of, of crime and, and you know, young teenage girl getting mugged. All kinds of bad things are happening because of the unmanaged camp at, at Ross. But closer to where we live was a managed camp that Susie O'Hara managed, and I just want to speak up for more of that in the future. I think that will help this program if you have supervised and managed camps. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate the comments of Supervisor Leopold and the questions of Supervisor Caput. Uh, you asked uh, Supervisor Leopold, what housing support can we offer these people? 
and that this is a critical component, everyone's homeless. Um, this is a, a system failure. We have such inequity in this society, this capitalist society, and it's gotten worse. Uh, basic rights have to do with the right to food, clothing, shelter. We've heard this forever. And we need a, a, a restructuring so that everybody has that and has, um, you know, economic support or jobs. And until those problems are resolved, we're dealing, I think, with the consequences of this inequitable structure. If these people, and you're talking about 20, had adequate, their needs met, I don't think we would have such horrible problems. Uh, regarding treatment, um, medications are often substance abuse, and the figure I heard is 100,000 people a year, approximately in this country, die from doctor-prescribed uh, drugs. It's a treatment holistic. I think the basic needs need to be met first. Talked about some brain damage. I'm going to pass out brain cell damage from microwaves and illustration. Everybody's on their cell phones and exposed to wireless. Big problem with behavior and health. Well, good morning, Board of Supervisors. I'm Andy Mills. I'm the Chief of Police in Santa Cruz, and I just came to offer support uh, for Sheriff Hart's program. We appreciate that a lot of this is centered in the city. We certainly need the help in terms of bed space in the jails, and this provides the recalcitrant ones with an, with an opportunity uh, to get a little bit healthier and so that intervention can take place. And so we applaud this effort, we support it. Our officers are already referring people to this team on a regular basis and just want to offer my support. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. That closes public comment and I'll bring it back to the board for action. Supervisor Friend. Thank you. So I also would like to add uh, my support for the program and also specifically say, uh, you know, there aren't very many people that actually cause a significant amount of issues for not just local law enforcement, but for the community at large, uh, behavioral health, uh, and other organizations. And they're well known. I mean, it's not as though it's a mystery uh, who the people are. It's not as though it's a mystery. Uh, we've had programs downtown that have worked to address this. This is, I think, a much uh, more holistic program than some of the previous programs we've dealt with that meets the balance of both public safety, but also the human component of what this specific difficult to reach population needs to get back on their feet and be productive members of society and have the dignity that they also deserve. So I think that having that balance is an important thing uh, within our, our community. But it's also a discussion that we seem to have all the time. I mean, it's a discussion that, that has been held in Santa Cruz County for the last few decades, which are uh, how do you solve uh, some of these very difficult and complex problems. And I think that what we're seeing now is an evolution toward a holistic approach. Normally, it exclusively falls on law enforcement, which is we need you to do more enforcement downtown, for example. Uh, but yet, there's a more complex component to how do you actually address the root causes associated with it. And every decision that the board makes from, be it affordable housing decisions, uh, to funding for behavioral health, uh, where those are located, and additional resources for law enforcement, tie into this solution, that what we asked the voters on Measure G was we said this is a complex issue that actually needs a holistic solution, but we need additional funding for it, and people overwhelmingly said yes. Um, I, I really do applaud the sheriff's work as well as Santa Cruz Police's work on recognizing that there are root causes uh, that, that need to be addressed on this, and I'm fully supportive of this program, and I'd like to move the recommended actions. So a motion by friend. Second. Second by McPherson. I just want to make uh, another comment. Um, this isn't the first time our sheriff's office under Sheriff Hart has stepped up and been a leader on, um, well, certainly in a community-wide basis, but in a national basis. It was just four or five years ago, when, and earlier on, uh, even before he got here, we got, uh, the sheriff's office got into a community policing effort that um, 
was recognized nationally. And so I really appreciate the behavioral science uh, services uh, get, being involved in this, and they they were they just as much initiated as anyone else. So I really do appreciate this effort from going from a reactive position to a proactive position in trying to help these people that are in need and are uh, seriously causing a lot of problems in our community. If we can get a relatively small number of them uh, shall we say, uh, to be become uh, good citizens, uh, we're gonna notice a significant difference in our community. So I just wanna thank you for your continuous work and your attention in this regard. Um, yes, I, I, I'll echo the comments. I, I like the way my colleague put it about a holistic approach. I think this is uh, uh, an honest attempt to, to do that. I also wanna make sure that when this reports back that we have information about who the referring you know, some statistic about who the referring um, uh, agencies are, because I, I wanna make sure this is a countywide program. Um, during the campaign, we talked about the number of mental health calls that our sheriff's office get, and I wanna make sure that we're doing something to meet those needs, as well as the needs in other parts of the county. You know, 20 people or 30 people isn't, you know, is, it, it's, it's limited, but I wanna make sure that the, the folks who are uh, um, helping pay for this program also uh, a benefit from the services directly. So that would be great information to have in the future. Thank you. And I'll just, uh, I'll just make one comment, which is uh, there is a whole system of care and system failures that need to be addressed that, that your two departments cannot address. But I also want to note, I mean, we have thousands of homeless people in Santa Cruz County who are not being arrested 43 times, who are not terrorizing people, who are not threatening people, who are not committing felonies. Uh, and uh, and we, have to, uh, we have to recognize and increase our, our ability to provide services when people need them, when they need them, but we also need accountability for people who are who are just creating an enormous amount of pain uh, and uh, trauma in the community uh, through their behavior, uh, where other similarly situated people are not doing that. Um, and so, uh, just keeping in mind the importance of the accountability uh, aspect of this program. Um, is, is in and of itself uh, incredibly important, and then providing the services as we can to help people um, make uh, the changes in their life uh, that, 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 and deal with, uh, deal with their conditions um, is, is important as well. Uh, so with that, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Uh, I'm gonna, it's 11.02. I'm gonna take a 13 minute break and come back at 11.15 uh, for the next items. I'm going to call the meeting back to order. We're now moving on to agenda item number nine, which is uh, to consider a report on the Homeless Emergency Assistance Program, or HEAP block grants funding, adopt a resolution accepting unanticipated revenue in the amount of $9,674,884 into the HEAP Trust Fund, adopt a resolution accepting unanticipated revenue in the amount of $1,156,000 into the Homeless Services Coordination Budget for sheltering and public health and safety and hygiene infrastructure, professional and special services, and approve the addition of a one uh, full-time equivalent position for HEAP implementation 
and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum uh, of the CIO and the planning director. Good morning, Chair Coonerty and members of the board. I'm Rainey Marr, Homeless Services Coordinator. And before you today is a report regarding the state's Homeless Emergency Assistance Program, which has awarded funding to continuums of care across the state. Our local continuum of care, the Homeless Action Partnership, has been allocated 9.7 million in funds to address homelessness within the next two years. The county's role is as the lead agency for the continuum of care and planning efforts for the HEAP program have been led by county staff. The state required that HEAP applicants conduct a collaborative process. Our COC carried this out through a very extensive local process, including numerous homeless action partnership and youth homelessness demonstration program meetings, a HAP priorities refresh meeting with 76 attendees, including elected officials, three jurisdictional stakeholder meetings with over 80 total attendees, including elected officials, and individual briefings with elected officials. We had the final approval of the HEAP allocations and the application by the joint HAP governing board and executive committee. And we had final approval of the HEAP RFP and an emergency allocation by the joint HAP governing board and executive committee. In order to expedite the use of the HEAP and cash funds, the joint HAP governing board and executive committee reached a consensus decision to make an emergency allocation of the COC's HEAP funds totaling a million dollars in advance of the RFP to cover urgent winter shelter and other costs through June 30th with the express purpose of alleviating human suffering and mitigating public health and safety risks. The allocation includes 600,000 for emergency shelter, 300,000 for public health and safety hygiene infrastructure, and also included is 100,000 for an immediate communications and public engagement process funded out of what's called the other category of HEAP funds. The HEAP funds also include $483,000 to cover administrative costs, and the limited term staffing position requested on today's item is funded out of the administrative costs and will support HEAP administration activities, including grant management, contracting, program development and oversight, data collection and evaluation, and mandated reporting to the state. Staff requests board adoption of a resolution to accept and appropriate the full HEAP allocation of funds into a trust fund on behalf of the Homeless Action Partnership. Adoption of a resolution to accept and appropriate a portion of HEAP funds into the Homeless Services budget for staffing costs and to fund professional and special services as stipulated by the joint HAP governing board and executive committee for emergency shelter, public health and hygiene services, and a communications and community engagement process. Staff also requests authorization to add a 1.0 full-time equivalent limited term position to support implementation of the HEAP program. These allocations have all been approved by the HAP Governing Board and Executive Committee and are all in alignment with the priorities and allocations established through the state collaborative process and it, consistent with the applications submitted <coughs> to the state. So I'd be happy to take any questions you may have. Do we have any questions? Supervisor Caput? Uh, no, I'll, I'll make a quick comment, thank you. Thank you, it's good to see you here, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to seeing this uh, implemented and started up. It's, uh, your microphone, Supervisor Caput, your microphone. Is it on? Well, uh, maybe I'm we not speaking you. into it. There you go. There okay. you go. <laughs> yeah, I, I apologize. Okay, it's on, but I, it was over there. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. It's good to see us doing this, and uh, it's become a huge problem especially in our county and uh, coastal co uh, communities, uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, problems. And it's just, it's exciting to see us actually going in there and trying to find a solution. I think we're gonna have some tough times because it's kind of new and what we're doing, but uh, that's how we learn and that's how we're gonna come up with a really good program here. And the money is given to us by the state and I hope we uh, spend it wisely. Thank you. 
Vice yeah, President. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Um, I, this is an emergency, and um, I, I want to thank the staff and so many who, uh, folks in our community who have uh, come together to look at this. Uh, the anticipation of the $10 million coming from the state uh, was to, to uh, come to some solutions and not more study. And uh, wisely, we have looked at this uh, before this, these funds were, were released, so we are ready to step up to the plate and get something in place. So I do appreciate that, uh, and I'm glad to see that we're assigning a, a full-time person to facilitate this. Uh, we have to, uh, there's, there's pressure on us. Uh, to spend this money, and um, we need to spend half of this $10 million in just the next 10 months. And so we need to spend the uh, rest by the June of 21 or we lose it. So there, there is an urgency to get this uh, contract going. I think we're in good position to implement a program that will be effective. Um, it'll be, cru be crucial that the Homeless Action Partnership uh, works swiftly to award the programs that will have a biggest impact in our county. And for me, um, this emergency sheltering places uh, the county, um, uh, it needs to be placed throughout the county. Um, I think that's pretty evident in what we've seen in the recent uh, months and some of our places here in Santa Cruz County. We won't be able to meet everyone's needs. Uh, $10 million is a lot of money, but this is a huge program and a, a, a tremendous endeavor for us to address. So I do appreciate the forethought and getting us ready to implement a program to get going as quickly as we can. And I uh, appreciate especially Rainy Moore. She's been fantastic at this. And uh, Lisa Benson of the CAO's office from the county. Thank you. Mr. President Leopold. Yeah, I will just say uh, that uh, given the tight deadlines that we have, uh, I hope uh, we're willing to commit all the time and focus necessary because we can't have deferral letters. We have to, 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 to keep this going, we have to, we have to hit every mark. Uh, so I'm glad we're bringing on extra staff to be able to do it. And um, I'm hopeful that, that the consensus decision making the, about the projects uh, will mean that there's broad uh, support. Uh, for them, and I think that will be helpful in the, the, the success of them as strategies. So now I'll open it up for public comment. Anyone who would like to speak to us? You have two minutes. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of Aptos. I, I am glad that the county's got $10 million. I think it's, um, it, it, we also have to, Recall that we have declared a, a crisis, an emergency, which allows the county to waive all public health and safety codes. So I don't want to see this money quickly spent because we have to spend it and not have something that's going to really give us a long-term um, solution. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the collaborative effort. I hope that you include the public, members of the general public in that, and um, I'm looking forward to seeing how it comes. And again, I really want to ask that you look at these tough sheds as something that can be um, a solution and, and look to the city of Oakland. Um, they've, they've been able to successfully house 75% of the people who stayed in those into permanent housing. So thank you very much. You no, know, I would be before the mic is Richard Lewis, Grey Panther. I never talk with you, but housing is something in my heart. Had you visited Las Trellis on Front Street, you would have saw 19 homeless sleeping on the floor with no support. My coaching is, my research says, county offices of education. Uh, I don't know your RFP, I don't even know if the county is going to be going in for a grant, but a gift of 100000 to the leadership in our county office of education to bring together, like Women Rise for Peace, Santa Cruz Rises for the Homeless, would create community action to complement all those people that follow the money. You know, building bridges is going to come in. I don't know all the players. But I, I want to say to all of you, if you take on what I shared with you earlier, framework is the resources to serve the homeless is within Cabrillo and what we call SSCCC that I'm involved with, 
I just want to say they want to pass a resolution to use the parking space for safe parking on the network of 115 campuses. Let's see what you're doing with Cabrillo for that safe place to park. Thank you. Did I do my two minutes? I don't know how this works, so maybe next time I'll watch this. But please, it's when you get to be my age, you have story. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for putting up the money. And John, I hope you're going to be there for the Poor People's Campaign a Thursday night at the uh, Family Resource Center. One hand doesn't know what the other hand is. I had suggested that Drew talk to you so that if you were there, people would come. Poor People's Campaign, just know later, Robin Hood Project out of New York, Craig's going to want to see it happen in his community because we have to change what it is to meet those homeless who are poor. Me one Thank of you. Them. Thank you. Uh, hello, Benjamin Kogan. I live in Live Oak. Um, and yeah, I wanted to just uh, second Becky Steinbrunner's um, motion and um, um, basically request that we don't just flush uh, these humans out. Uh, I know you guys are figuring out a plan, you got to use this money, um, but if they're just kind of like, if they don't have another place to go, they'll find another place in the city and community to go and build up another tent shelter. And I have made a request that maybe we can get some land for $10 million, we can definitely buy some land and house them there and have them even like sign a waiver rules and saying, I will not do drugs or drink on this property and all this stuff. And we can have volunteers like Food Not Bombs feed them and all that. Even that, you know, even other volunteers to make sure their safety and well being on the property. But I just wanted to say that request, and um, you know, eventually it'd be great if everyone had a house and a door. Um, so yeah, I know you're working towards that, and thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name's Serge Cagno, uh, member of the General Hat Board, and I wanted to uh, say my appreciation for county staff and city staff have put a lot of time into working on this process and getting a lot of voices. Uh, involved. Um, I wanted to make a comment to what you said about uh, collaborative decision making. And it's something I've said before that I advocate for, for the implement, for the choosing of the projects and the implementation of the projects. Uh, the HAP board uh, has been asked on their values about projects, but about the decision making of implementation, um, there is no uh, group or committee from them that's actually able to talk about programs because we really do want the best outcomes that we can get and as much as i respect the intelligence and dedication and compassion of city and county staff the people who actually do the work the people who actually are the nonprofits and are doing the services having them be a part of the evaluation process in an ongoing way to make sure the money is a useful thing i would ask for um some suggestion or direction of the HAP to get more voices into the room on those kind of things. Thanks. Thank you, Michael Archer, uh, Santa Cruz. Um, I have two points. Um, one, I, I look at you and I see probably, you know, a group of the smartest men and women here in the county, and we know that this is a national problem. And I would like, in my fairy tale little mind, for us to work on a blueprint for the rest of the country, to, to come up with a game plan where we could say, hey, we took taking care of this. And hearing what this woman said about Oakland, it's like, let's look to Oakland. Let's, I mean, we are the smartest people. And I think we can come up with a blueprint that we can hand to the rest of the country. My second point is, is that in 98, I was an Australian, drove with a friend for about 3,000 miles, and every now and then we'd see a, an abandoned Chinook mobile home. And I asked him, what's that about? And he says, well, you, the, the government realized that they disrespected the aboriginals. So they thought, well, to resolve this, you know, taking away their land, let's give them all a Chinook or whatever this model was. And they did it without asking them. And they got these things, and some of them said, we don't need this, and took it out and trashed it and left it just as a symbol to say, 
you don't know us. And, and so with that, my point is, is that as hard as I know as it would be to incorporate the homelesses ideas into it, because you can't understand what the heck they're saying most of the time, um, but to try to incorporate what they want. You know, to find out how, how can we take care of them in the, in the midst of what they're going through. And that's all I'm asking. Thanks. Thank you. So I'm just going to repeat real quick, because this is what I came for. I'm Yasmina Porter. I'm representing the Tannery Campus that includes residents, businesses, theater, arts council. Um, they elected me and some others to represent them specifically on the issue of how we're impacted by the homeless camp. I'm so happy that you guys are gonna accept the funds from the state and do something good. Um, basically, we wanna just uh, reaffirm that we have a model here that has worked to, um, as a place to temporarily house people that are not housed, the camp that was on River Street, and again, we're not NIMBYs because the River Street camp is actually literally closer to my home. So I'm not saying get them out of my neighborhood, I'm saying they need to be managed and supervised. And um, the police chief said that there was only one real incident that happened the entire time that that River Street camp was managed and supervised well and had lots of you know rules and order there and, and people were able to transition. Um, and then also to look to transitioning them to housing or rehab or whatever people need and there's a model in DC. Oh my God, I forgot the name of it, what's it called? The, those big centers that have everything in them. Navigation, Navigation Center. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you to the people who just spoke. What great uh, suggestions and input and references to what other communities are doing to uh, help with this homeless problem. <laughs> and the idea that people who are most affected by this should be involved in the planning process is a key component of how you proceed. I, this gentleman referred to uh, what he saw in Australia, and uh, I think back to when I was traveling in 1966 uh, the, in the former Soviet Union, and I visited my mother's cousin who lived uh, in Moscow, there were no homeless people on the streets. They had housing after the war, small but available to everyone. Um, I think she paid like 5% of her income for rent. A whole different structure of a system. And I, in my 20s, was able to walk out on the streets at night, go into the metro. I had no fear. I was very comfortable and pleasant. And so we have a big structural problem. So I hope as you proceed that you incorporate what has been suggested here by members of this community that are very reasonable and um, giving you good direction. So often I see you have plans for something and you just approve it as it is. And I'm sitting here and listening and going, wow, what a good idea somebody just put forward. Um, that needs to be incorporated. So please incorporate what these people have said, uh, how to proceed with that amount of money. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Don Lane. Um, I'm a member of the Homeless Action Partnership Board and also chair of Smart Solutions to Homelessness, a community organization. And I wanna just make, make two quick comments. One, the staff that, that has worked on this um, to pull, pull this all together with a tremendous amount of pressure, they have done a really good job of putting something together that can move us forward in a timely way. So I really appreciate the work that's been done there. The other thing I want to mention is this is a kind of an unusually important opportunity moment for the community, and I think it's two, two pieces of that. One is the funding that we're, we've, we're talking about, and the other, frankly, is the camp, the Gateway Ross camp, because it has kind of elevated the people, the community's attention on the issue of homelessness to an even higher level, not to say it wasn't high before, but now it's at a peak. 
So we have this great opportunity because of those two things. One piece that is incorporated in this spending plan that I want to just call out a little more is the community engagement part. It speaks somewhat to the issues that some others have come up with, come up um, speaking about having the voices of homeless people involved in decision making, but also really just the broader community, not only involved in the decision making, but having an opportunity to understand what's going on. We do not have a very clear picture for the average person in the community to understand what the Homeless part Action Partnership is, where this money came from, whether the city, what's the city doing, what's the county doing. It's a very confusing situation, even for me, who's right in the thick of it. And we, so we really have some work to do to bring, create opportunities for the community to both make suggestions about new things, but also understand what's going on now. Because there's a lot going on that people have, do not see. And we need to share that with the community and then have them comment on that. If they don't like it, that's, we need to hear that. But also, I think people will be surprised to see some of the good work that's going on already that just can be boosted by this funding. So I do really encourage us to um, in, you know, have real high community engagement as we go forward. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, I'll bring it back, close public comment, and bring it back to the board for action. Um, actually, I guess let me just state. So one of my concerns, I, overall this is really a wonderful approach, and I appreciate everyone who's been involved in bringing this money back into our community. The $100,000, as was just mentioned, for communications, um, we've heard all morning from people who are either worried about not enough housing for people in need and we're in a crisis, and $100,000 is a lot of hotel bed nights uh, or first and last month's rent. Uh, secondarily, we've heard um, from people who are worried about impacts near child care centers or near shelters and they want it well managed and they want security. Um, so primarily, we are going to be judged on the impacts we create and the, the environment we create for both people who are unhoused and also for people who are um, uh, people who are uh, living adjacent or feeling these impacts and spending money on communications instead of action uh, makes me nervous and so I want to make sure uh, that if we're going to approve this money today um, that we're not going to be back at a place when there's a daycare center who says I'm having impacts and I need security that we aren't going to say I'm sorry we don't have security or we're going to have 20 uh, FIT clients, so we're going to say, well, one of them, if we could get him into trans, uh, a SLE, uh, he'd be much more likely to maintain his sobriety. And we're not going to say, oh, we don't have money, and we, but yet we have money to have community conversations and to, to do communications work, which is always important, but in an emergency, it's not always the most important. And so I want to understand how you're going to manage those expectations with that money specifically around communications and do we need a $100,000 communication program? Can we do it in-house for less? Can we uh, hold that money back? in order to, uh, to make sure that we're providing adequate services for people. Because I don't want to be in a resource scarce discussion when people are experiencing real impacts, but, but we can direct them to a community conversation uh, about, about those impacts. I want to I actually be able to have resources to solve those problems. Would you like us to provide a little more background yes. around that? Okay. So um, the $100,000 that was identified um, by the HAP govern HOT Board and Executive Committee is part of an allocation within the heap of about $193,000 that we have identified as other, in addition to all the programmatic areas that we, the, the HAP has um, identified as uh, the investments we, we want to make. Um, I absolutely would concur that I think there's every intention on the part of the HAP general membership and then the, the existing governance structure to utilize every dollar to its best purpose with the specific focus of addressing um, the emergency situation and the needs of people um, experiencing homelessness. We do, we will make sure that we use that money wisely if we do not have to use all of that to engage the level of community conversation that the HAP has um, all agreed that is necessary to do the kind of sightings and service delivery we need, we would absolutely redirect that portion back to service. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I understand the concern that you bring, uh, you know, every dollar is precious. 
Um, when we're talking about uh, a countywide effort to address homelessness, um, a hundred thousand dollar communication plan is it is is probably pretty little. Um, and if we were thinking about downtown, that might seem like a lot of money. But if we're thinking about it, a countywide response. Uh, figuring out how, how to best use that money to be able to communicate what the strategies are um, <clears throat> seems to be important. Uh, I was surprised uh, when we found out that Santa Cruz City Council members didn't know that we were funding um, the, the River Street encampment before. So there's clearly um, a, a need for us to do a better job of communicating to the public, to our peers, um, countywide about what's going on because do the people in Capitola or SoCal or, or Watsonville understand what we're doing? Uh, do the people in Santa Cruz or Live Oak on, or San Lorenzo Valley? It, um, the, we all have a little bit of information, but to have some kind of coordinated um, uh, effort to share what our strategies are <clears throat> seems to be very important. and. Um, I, uh, we, we should use the money wisely. We shouldn't spend uh, uh, casually. But I think there's a, it's, there's clear that there's a real need to be able to better communicate what what is going on around our homelessness response. So, I, I uh, that's not in opposition. It's right. just uh, it's just trying and, to find. And I agree with that. I just want to make sure that when when issues are raised and we're rolling out and spending and building resources, that we aren't going to cry poor. When we have something that could cost twenty thousand dollars to to uh, to add additional staff, uh, part time staff, housing navigator, or we're not going to say, uh, well, we could have first alarm around that daycare center, which is experiencing <coughs> real impacts, but we can't afford that because there's no money. I, I, if, if if we're going to spend this, then we have to make sure that we're that we're clear that we aren't going to then make the excuse that we don't have the money for real things that are the impacts that are stories that are people are having on the ground that are that are, are relatively low ticket, right? Like we're solving a large, large problem that tens of millions of dollars couldn't fix. But but for things that where a small amount of money could make a big difference <coughs> for an individual or a, or a neighborhood, um, I think we're going to be, it's going to be incumbent upon us to come up with that money from these funds to address those problems because that's, that's people are communicating to us their concerns. And if we have the ability to respond, we're going to need to. So there's your, yeah. your there's your a big challenge to both yeah. tell us everything we need to know, but spend wisely and, and have yeah. money available for everything yeah. else. Yeah. Good and luck I, with that. Uh -huh. I, I'd be ready to move the yeah. recommended actions. Well, uh, oh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, have that's all I, I'll have a comment. Yeah, I just uh, I appreciate Supervisor Coonerty's uh, comments because uh, you're right. We want to spend this well because uh, I want to think give everybody a reality check here. Ten million dollars is a lot of money, but it is not. We're going to be resource scarce at the end of two years. If we're, no matter how we spend this. We're not going to be able to solve the homeless problem overall, but, uh, but uh, with $10 million. But I think with the, the communications we've had, and you're going to hear more of this in the next item with the city and the county cooperating, we're going to do this as efficiently as possible, and I think subject matter uh, efficiently as possible as well. Uh, we heard some comments about people wanting input from the homeless themselves, what their need, what are their needs. Uh, believe me, there's been outreach to that to do that uh, in the months past, and we're trying to. Uh, make that part of the solution that we're pre presenting this t at this time. But there is a timeline, and I'll tell you, two years goes very quickly, and we want to do this as, as best we can. We have had received some input, but uh, it's not going to be the total solution, but we're going to do the best job possible, and I feel confident with the input we've had from our staff and the outreach that we've had on this board as well that we're going to do a very good job uh, of addressing our homeless uh, uh, issue that we have here the best we can with ten million dollars and I just pledge that to you and I feel confident we'll be able to do that okay. uh, Mr. Capito. Uh, and you've been working with the uh, and talking with the veteran services also and a combination of how you know they're they're willing to help there is federal money in addition to this uh, to help with that but anyway uh, you know, good job, and I'll move for approval unless it's already been made, or I'll second it if 
No, I don't. Uh, so motion I'll, by I'll, I'll make a motion. Second. Second by Leopold. Uh, so we have a motion and a second. Any other comments? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Um, so let's move on to uh, item number 10, which is to consider a report on the unsanctioned uh, encampment abatement plan and approve an amendment to the, co to the contract with the Salvation Army in the amount of $315, $315,000, 341 uh, for a new not to exceed amount of 693427 for the provision of emergency shelter services as outlined in the memorandum of the CAO. Same team. Thank Back you, again. Mr. Chair. Yes. Lisa Benson, CAO's office. I will take the, the lead on this, but Rainey is going to be covering part of the items. As mentioned, our purpose today is to provide an update on the city county planning effort to resolve the gateway encampment and get additional direction. Um, and we will be reviewing in detail that joint action plan that is uh, included as an attachment to the uh, staff report. And then that secondary action we're requesting is approved. Um, the amendment for additional contract services for emergency shelter services provided by the Salvation Army at the Laurel Street uh, facility for single women, family with children, and mobility impaired um, individuals that are experiencing homelessness. In terms of the staff report, I'm going to be providing a, a little bit of background on the encampment um, as well as uh, some, some information as to our ongoing and immediate actions around uh, public health in particular, and Mimi Hall, our director of HSA, is here if there are specific questions around, around that. I'll then review the joint action plan, both the principles and actions, and then Rainey is available, available to address questions around the contract amendment. Uh, so just for, again to sort of provide some general context, this encampment um, uh, at, where we try not to, really try not to label it uh, Ross Encampment or Gateway Plaza, but everyone knows the location at Highway, Highway 1 and 9. Um, it, it started in, in late October and really uh, expanded in, in November um, and, and, and continued to grow, grow through the winter months. We did a census, a loose census in the beginning of January and, and estimate the population there. They're somewhere between 100 and 30 to 200 people. It's, it's hard to really estimate specifically. Um, in the time, that time, we've been working actively with the city to immediately address, in particular, public uh, health risks. And uh, our, public health, our public health officer has worked uh, from pretty much day one with the city to address sanitation and hygiene um, considerations at the camp. And the city has been very proactive and um, in increasing those, those facilities um, as the camp has grown, as the risks of public, uh, public health have increased. In addition, our um, homeless person's health care healthcare project outreach team has been on site since December um, in doing regular engagement and um, field, field delivery and medical services there, again, with that specific goal of mitigating public public health risks associated with this type of encampment. Uh, we started actively meeting with city staff to really talk about how to address this unsanctioned encampment, um, both from a public safety and public health risk standpoint in, in I want to say, mid-December. And, uh, and it had articulated a number of, of joint actions to both address public safety and public health. With that, I'm going to move actually to the the, um, the action plan that we put before you today. Um, and this is something we crafted with a full collaboration of city staff and under the guidance of a two by two committee to provide us um, increased perspective on what principles we should be moving forward in this. The action plan, uh, I will say, is probably most important, targets March 15th for fully transitioning um, or providing opportunities for those people at that camp to move to alter alternative sheltering options and with the focus of abating that camp in March. <laughs> And the abatement of that camp as people leave um, is really a city responsibility, but we're fully working with them to support that transition. In the uh, action plan, it really can be focused in two different areas, principles and actions. Uh, the principles that we um, 
we in, in integrated into it really reflect that guidance of the two by two committee and that balancing between getting services and shelter alternatives to the people who are at the camp and addressing the broader community impacts, public safety impacts, and public health impacts that I think we've already heard quite significantly about from the public in many meetings here. Uh, the next principle is, again, be prior to actually being able to transition people to alternative options, really addressing health um, health and sanitation concerns as the size of that camp has grown. And again, the um, city has been very fast to comply with, with public health guidance on how to minimize public, public health uh, risks there. And uh, we, again, we, are, we moved from ad hoc outreach from the HPHP staff to regular outreach Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Uh, the next aspect was the idea is how do we prevent this um, moving moving uh, this kind of thing happening in the future. And so the, the third principle in the action plan is really around that policy direction we, we received from you all back in, I wanna say November 2017, of moving towards a year round 24 seven shelter in both North and South County, that we need to have something that is more stable and not just winter based. And this again reiterates that, that, um, that direction and actually targets opening that type of shelter, if at all possible, by July 1st. Uh, it also then uh, takes that idea of, again, the balance of abating and also giving uh, options for folks to move to. The fourth principle is how do we come forward with policies to govern this, if this develops in the future, how to address it before it gets to this level of risk. And so those are the four, I would say, principles of this action plan that the, we've jointly developed with the city. In terms of the specific actions that are laid out, the first one is an idea of a phased rollout of additional temporary emergency shelter to um, address, uh, provide at least 100, uh, capacity to address about 150 people as we're, we're estimating that as the population at this camp and you'd be willing to utilize all different kinds of sheltering, emergency shelter operational models that are available from indoor shelter, managed campgrounds, safe parking, population specific strategies, that all of those things need to be on the table. Similarly, that it is a multiple location approach. Um, sort of in, inherent in that action, in that premise is that a multiple location approach at maybe smaller sized sheltering operations um, allows for more lim limiting any p the impacts of shelters and then hosting neighborhoods. Um, the sort of balance to that is that means you have more shelters and you're not gonna get the economies of scale of larger, sh larger sized shelters, but that's one of the things the team came forward with as a, as a recommendation. Um, that, then, and then the, we're also focusing in terms of sites, any um, sites that where we already have had shelter operations. I'm focusing there first to address that, that goal of 150 capacity. Um, and then if we need to, if we aren't able to realize that at those sites, we will look at additional sites. The other action is to um, work very f in a very focused way to see if we have community partners that can help us move forward with a site and operation of a navigation center by July 1st. And assuming we're able to do that to come forward within 60 days with an action plan to make that operational. And then the, the final actions are really to lay out specific um, strategies on the side of the city in terms of public safety uh, strategies that they will implement until the camp is fully resolved and similarly what the county will do in terms of continued outreach and service connection through both uh, health services agency but also our human services department to try and connect people at the encampment with services. So this is the, the action plan that we were able to develop in partnership with the city and uh, put before you today and look for your, uh, your feedback and direction on. Sure. And I, um, I'll just first say, so I'm one of the members of the two by two that's been uh, working on this along with Supervisor McPherson's office. Um, the work out of the CAO's office has been uh, tremendous in both 
uh, time, effort, and quality, uh, and I appreciate that work. And in my time, this is the closest the city and the county have worked on this issue, um, and uh, the fact that we now have resources coming in to uh, at least partially address the issue makes a big difference. And so I want to take a moment and appreciate that work, and also rec but recognize we're going to take action today. The city council will take action tonight. Um, Ideally, as the staff has recommended, those actions will be congruent um, and make a, give a clear direction for the community uh, and frankly the people of the encampment of where, where we're going with this. Uh, and so, um, so I look forward to continuing this partnership so we can get um, results and deal with a wholly unacceptable situation um, in our community. So yeah, I'll, I very well said, I'll second that. I, I think this plan, represents the, the, the most positive collaboration between the, the city and the county on a big issue that I haven't witnessed, certainly since I've been on the County Board of Supervisors. Uh, we have a, a moral obligation to better the homeless people and their living conditions, uh, but we also need to minimize the recognized public health and safety risks that are posed by that community. And I think this is a, a very good step forward, um, and I appreciate the work of the CAO's office and the city administration's office, and I know <coughs> we're gonna hear, I would hope that we're gonna hear uh, from them, and I can tell you, uh, as a member of that two by two committee, uh, there were uh, suggestions made that were reasonable and some were unbelievable. But uh, I think we've come to a good, grounded settling point here, and I look forward to implementing this plan, but I, want, I would like to hear from the public. Would you like us to walk through the second piece to the staff report around the expanding, the specific contract expanding shelter? Sure. Okay. I think, you know, we, we've read it, so okay, without... Okay, keep it crisp. Yeah, keep it. So uh, what's before you is a proposed contract amendment with the Salvation Army. As you know, they're operating the shelter program at the VFW on 7th Avenue and have been doing that since the beginning, or sorry, mid-November. Uh, mid the proposal before you today is to add a shelter program at the Laurel Street Salvation Army building on Laurel Street in downtown Santa Cruz, and that is for a population different than what we've served before. It's not just a general population, it will be for families with children, single women, and the mobility impaired individuals that may be in wheelchairs or otherwise have handicaps um, because the Salvation Army building is equipped with ADA bathroom and other facilities that make it easier for that population to be served. Um, the shift of some of the people who are now at the VFW, some of the women and those that are in wheelchairs over to Laurel Street will open up space for single men or other adults uh, that may be in couples. So uh, by opening this shelter, we'll be able to provide outreach and, and hopefully engage some of those folks that are at the current encampment and get them into shelter. There will be 40 additional beds coming online and they're prepared to open the shelter tomorrow uh, pending your board's approval. And just to quickly confirm, there are sufficient funds in the Salvation Army contra contract uh, to provide the same level of security that currently exists at the, um, at the VFW site. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, Supervisor Leopold. Well, <clears throat> I, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I think this is a, a good plan. Um, uh, I'm glad to see that we're opening up a second winter shelter uh, location because I do think that what our past experience has shown that having two places gives us the opportunity to best uh, 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 deploy uh, folks where, where they can um, feel most safe and uh, where, where it will work out. And this is a, this is a big expansion uh, for Live Oak. You know, we, we've done this uh, shelter this is our. Uh, this is the third year in Live Oak, but now this is going to be pushing it to almost nine months that it's going to be operating there, and um, uh, so that that has impacts. I think that that uh, th as part of a collaborative plan in which we're we're working on a lot of different things, it makes sense. But it's it's big in a residential neighborhood like Seventh Avenue. Can I just clarify, I, I know that there have been discussions about extending the VFW shelter operations through June, but that is not currently part of this contract amendment. Oh, so it would stop so, at, at April 15th? Unless we take unless, further action. Unless we take further action. This amendment 
continue, doesn't do, doesn't make any changes to the operations at the VFW. It brings the Laurel Street Shelter online April, I'm uh, sorry, tomorrow through June 30th. I can provide a little bit. I probably made that a little bit confusing. Um, continued operations at the VFW is envisioned as part of the action plan, but it is not executed in this document. But that would be part of the additional 150 shelter capacity that we, we are targeting moving towards through June 30th. Yeah, in our conversations, that yes. definitely seems like you're bringing yes. that to us. It would, that, that separate contract action would have to come forward. Yeah, thank you. All right, I will now open up uh, for public comment. Hello again. I'm Yasmina Porter here to speak on behalf of the tannery in relationship to the Ross camp. So we as a body, including lots of businesses in the area, um, there's two specific things that we'd like to see added to your abatement plan as soon as possible not waiting till March. One is moving the border back of the Ross camp, moving it off of the walkway and the pathway for two reasons. One is because of safety, because our children don't feel safe to walk. We've had a teenager that was mugged, and so they're going to school on the highway. They're trying to cross over the highway, and it's really dangerous for the children. And secondly, because of the water, and there's needles, and there's human feces, we have a videotape of one of the toilets leaking, so we want to have the border moved back off of the, off of the walkway, off of the levee from our water supply and for the children. Secondly, um, immediately, and for at least three months afterwards, we'd like to have 24-hour security from Panther security patrols that would help uh, walk around the tannery and also Felker Street. Um, the reason for that is because we've experienced at least a 30% in reported crime incidents, um, not just violence, but theft. Many of the people at the tannery, it's low-income housing, they're living just a few hundred dollars away from homelessness themselves. I've had my car broken into twice, and the people are getting in the car and staying in the car. So this, these all things are, are, and one, I wanna speak to just two other quick stories. Um, Alex Hall, who lives on Felker Street, is in a wheelchair because of of the human feces when he, he he's paralyzed so it rolls into his house on the wheels of his wheelchair and Adam White who's another neighbor had all of his tools stolen he's a contractor so he wasn't able to work and we had to pull together to help him pay his rent and feed his child so we need those two things right away the fence moved back and security and we are allies thank you, thank you. Good afternoon, Rena McDonnell with the John Stewart Company. Um, we manage the tannery. I'm here on behalf of the owner and developer of the tannery, Art Space Inc. Um, they have provided a letter that was meant for the city, but they um, wanted addressed here as well. Um, Art Space acknowledges and is very grateful for the city's involvement and partnership in the community of the tannery. Um, the city has committed to you know, monitoring the riverbanks and the street parking and the camping on the streets with security services and we're very thankful for that. They're very appreciative of that. Um, also really supportive of reopening the River Street Camp. Um, you know, it's just kind of disappointing to have that closed down and then this new camp pop up right on the other side of us without um, really considering the fact that the people had to go somewhere. And um, so really thankful that the River Street Camp is going to be reopened. Um, and we're supporting the city and the county's efforts to work together to resolve this issue. I'm thankful for all the things that have been on this agenda um, who are, that are addressing this and the money that's becoming available to find permanent solutions, not temporary emergency sol solutions that we have to deal with every three months. Because that's what we're dealing with at the tannery. Every three months, people get uprooted, we have a spike in crimes, and then things get settled, and then people get uprooted, and we have a spike in crimes. So um, it's very dangerous, as Yasmina said, for our kids who have to go to school through that route. Um, and we're really concerned about what's going on. So we're thankful and appreciative and supportive of this plan to move the camp and we'll do what we can as neighbors to make that happen. Uh, Serge Cagno, um, I, again, I would uh, 
very much in support of the plan and very much in appreciation of the work that the county and staff and city staff have put into it. Um, a couple questions that I had um, was asking in that though absolutely city and county coming together to make, make the plan, the, the, the HAP board and the actual providers of programs didn't really get a voice on implementation. Having policy people writing a plan on implementation without implementation's <laughs> voice uh, leaves holes in the plan. Is, uh, so for March 15th, having that cleared out, and I understand that's a city choice also, um, but what if there are not 150 beds? What if some of those programs don't work out? Does that still get cleared out? It just seems like deciding that date without having definite programs, uh, it's jumping the gun a little bit. On the contract with Salvation Army, again, not having different implementation uh, county, uh, community members and program voice in it, uh, originally there wasn't any site storage for people to be in the program. And I talk to a lot of case managers and they ask about how to get somebody in the program and it's really complicated because there's not an intake site. There's supposed to be an email, somebody gets a call back if they get a site. So I would ask that somehow an intake site gets worked in, whether that's 1220 River Street or within one of the programs, try to find some place. People can't even get out of the rain. Like the place to sit and wait for to see if you can get in is at Coral Street at the end. You can't get out of the rain, you're in the dark, there's not a bathroom there, it's not safe. So trying to get more voices in as you decide implementation, I think improves outcomes for everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos. Um, thank you for the good report and for taking this action. It has troubled me a lot to see this encampment and especially in the very cold weather that we've been having recently in the wet. Um, it, it puzzled me a bit that, that the camp on River Street closed and that's when we all saw this camp um, come up. So I really applaud the county and the city working together to keep something up year round. It makes sense because this will always be a problem. And um, to shift people randomly around just by closing one site is not fair um, to the communities or to those who are scrambling for a place to live where they won't be hassled. Um, I, wherever it goes, I, I want it to be near where those people are. I think we need to look at, again, using the Veterans Memorial Building that has been used in the past. And it's downtown, it's where those, those people are who need this help. And um, it's also near the transit center, and that's a, an issue that I've questioned about the use of the Veterans Building on 7th Street. It's not really near public transit. So they have to be bused or something. That's an expense. So let's make them more independent. Let's give them bus passes and put these places where they can go and get themselves there and not have to be bused. Um, but again, I really want to emphasize the importance of public outreach and not just having these things show up in the neighborhoods and have them um, meet with a lot of resistance and and problems for the people. We all care, we're all compassionate people, but this has to be done transparently and with public input and partnership by everybody, including the homeless. Thank you very much. Now I know how this works. This is Richard Beck. Um, I have in my hand here what we call uh, Region 4 of the 115 community colleges. I'd really like to share with it. I'm gonna read it, hopefully get through in the two minutes because Cabrillo has a sheriff's department and region four is made up of a cluster where this is a resolution presented by that region. If you go to Facebook, it is SSCCC region four. And uh, Basically, I'm a stand for technical assistance, training, and funding, particularly in the area of equity. For example, the Latinos statewide aren't even listed as a caucus in that structure. So the resolution will be brought to their state government in April. And that's student government or community colleges, so regions can create a resolution if the students back it up 
We got 59s, I got it. All right, so it says, whereas the California Community Colleges Chancellor's Office conducted a survey, bottom line, these are the ones where if you go to a, uh, a college, homeless people can take a shower. I asked your staff to do some research, and I, I don't have a place, but I'll drop it off later. This, but it concludes with a resolve, the Student Senate of California Community Colleges requires each California community college to have a concrete policy for overnight parking available on their website. So as we are a county and other organizations are looking at creating safe places to park, it's a no-brainer that you could do some research best I can. Uh, got 10 seconds. Thank you for all. I call you all give a damn supervisors. We can do better and hope we can connect more about what we want to do up in Watsonville. Thank you. Hi, my name is Candace Elliott and I'm a member of the Workforce Development, uh, Workforce Development Board for Santa Cruz County, uh, the Alliance of Women Entrepreneurs. I've been working in downtown Santa Cruz for the past five years as the HR manager for the Glass Jar. Um, and I've recently become the downtown liaison for the city of Santa Cruz. Um, and in that position, I've been talking with a lot of community members about this funding. And um, there is a lot of concern that it will just disappear and that um, there will not be effective action taken on this issue of homelessness. Um, and one of the issues that I, uh, that has been brought up to me is creating a permanent location and a permanent solution. Um, and I think that in the neighborhoods, there is an idea that a permanent solution is a permanent problem. And I think that we can move past that. Um, and that creating a permanent solution will enable us to bring in groups who can actually manage camps and can do this in the way that it's supposed to be professionally uh, done. Uh, so thank you. I, um, bottom of my heart, want to thank all of you. Uh, I'm with uh, Mr. McPherson. This is, this is a moral issue. This is, the, for me, the most important thing we say about ourselves as a society is how we take care of those who've been rejected and thrown out and don't know what to do and don't know how to get back in. And so has setting this program up. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's bottom of my heart, thank you. And um, I'll find my point. Okay, you got $100,000 approved for communication. So I want to ask that you communicate to the public how we can help, how we can volunteer, how we who sit and moan and groan about, you know, seeing this at Ross, but yet don't know what to do to help. And so I, I just ask, as a member of community, put, you know, put it on all the telephone poles on what I can do to, to, to help you take care of the homeless. So thank you. I would really like to see some of the recommendations here put into what you're going to pass. You often add amendments on, and I'd like to see that done. And uh, yes, this is a moral issue, and we have a system that isn't, has a lot of problems with what's ethical and moral, and I gave you all a copy before of this cartoon uh, sort of put out by the union, and you see this young medical professional with his clipboard, and it says, are you feeling sad and depressed? You may be suffering from the symptoms of capitalism, and it lists homelessness, poverty, unemployment, et cetera. We have a system problem. We need a different structure that provides ethically for everybody to be able to live decently. And I appreciate your efforts and the expression here of people who want to help out however they can. Thank you. Benjamin Kogan here, I just want to leave you with that the amount of money spent on the Iraq war is enough to eradicate the poor. 
if we didn't have such a militarized budget, we could take care of all the people here in Santa Cruz, California, United States. And you are welcome to bring that up and let them know. Thanks. That concludes public comment. I'll bring it back uh, to the board Mr. for Chair? discussion and action. Yeah, I, I would um, like to move the recommended actions of the staff report to accept the city county uh, report addressing the gateway plaza encampment in particular and to approve an amendment to the fiscal year 1819 contract with the Salvation Army uh, to provide the emergency sheltering services. Uh, I just want to note that I did hear the concern about, uh, the gentleman spoke about a need for communications for those who are homeless to get, find a communication spot of some type and a storage, but I think that is inherent in what we're trying to do. But uh, I would like to uh, make some additions that uh, the young lady from the Tannery Center uh, made uh, about moving the boundaries uh, when this is, um, when this movement from the gateway encampment is done and uh, to provide the 24-hour security to that, uh, have that included in the motion as well. So those would be additions to the motion. And I'll second that. I'll, I, if I could just comment on, on, on that motion. Uh, some of the actual management of the camp, because it's in the city limits, is actually uh, dependent on the city uh, and their law enforcement, because they have land use authority in that area now. In terms of funding the security, we can certainly work on that, but in terms of the actual management of the camp, we can communicate that to the city, we can incorporate it in the in our plan. That's, yeah, and I, I, at the end of the day, they're gonna be the ones that set up that yeah. fence and enforce it, but I think just to include it in the plan. We can do that. Okay, so that won't be part of the motion, but I mean, included in the motion, but- We can include the it in the plan, plan but just to, yeah, got it. We just to let you know that the city has land use authority there, and ultimately it's up to them to do that. So, uh, so you have a motion for the recommended action with the additional direction of uh, including in the plan the moving of the fence and the additional security. Uh, it was motioned by uh, McPherson, second by Coonerty. Any other comments? Well, I'd just like to briefly say, so the, the problem isn't unique to our area, but the solutions fall uniquely on local government. And one of the things that we need to recognize is that we have an intractable affordable housing issue. You've had funding that's moved away from day services uh, at both the state and federal level. You have a historic winter shelter site that had to be eliminated because of location issues. You have a complex population that you are dealing with. And so, peop and, and also when it came, there were questions about the, per the, the previous managed site, uh, there were a lot of commitments made at the time that that would be temporary in order to ensure that the neighborhood actually supported it. And then there was extensions to that at the time that weren't viewed as popular by the neighborhood. And so it is good to hear that that's something that people actually want to have come back into their neighborhood, because we had heard, the board had heard from a lot of people who didn't support it at the time. And so the question, I, I think uh, Ms. Elliott's point was great. I think the question that was also raised about what can be done by the community, I think one of the biggest things that the community do is can stand up and say that we want this cited within our area. Because uh, there is a lot of, objections to any kind of permanence existing in any neighborhood within any county in the United States. I guarantee you no one comes to the Board of Supervisors and says build housing next to me, build homeless shelters next to me, build social services next to me, ever. So one thing that the community can do is say that we have a shared responsibility, a shared sacrifice, we truly believe that we're going to care for the poorest among us in a progressive community, then you got to step up with action and also say that we're willing to take those services, those programs, and those challenges on whatever they may be within our neighborhood. That's not what we tend to hear as elected officials. I've never been to a community meeting where people tell me to build something, they tell me to not do something. They don't say, hey, sh cite a shelter near me. They say, don't sh cite a shelter near me. There's always an, a reason. There's always a good reason. But at some point that cycle has to stop or we'll never actually get a real handle on this issue because I don't see any true help coming from the federal government. I see some help coming from the state government, but it still takes local land use decisions to actually make it happen. So unless we as a community are actually willing to have that stand up and have that honest discussion where we're willing to actually take that burden on because we already absorb all of the issues associated with it, then I don't think we're actually gonna break that cycle. And this is just a very small first step in, in that solution process. 
Supervisor Leopold. Well, I invite my colleague to come to some community meetings in Live Oak, because when we talked about the Capitola Road project, people said they did want affordable housing. Um, and they did want social services. So uh, it's, it, I, I don't disagree with your point, but I'm, I'm not saying it's, it's, there are people who are trying to be inclusive and, and, and make something happen. I, I thought it's not unanimous, you know, <laughs> right? I mean, I understand that. Yeah, I think you're being generous, but I, uh, I'll but take But we it. had a meeting where we had 100 people uh, for uh, the Capitola Road project, and the vast majority of them um, were in support of the project. So. Uh, so it, it, we have to do the work. I mean, that's why the outreach and education becomes super important, because you have to do work on the front end to help people understand what's going on. You have to be able to have answers about how something is going to be run. You have to do community organizing to, to get the people who care about that and not just focus on the, on the six people who ri live around the property, but the entire community who's going to benefit from uh, what's going on. That's how we can make things happen. And, um, it's what we did when, when, we, uh, when we looked at the VFW as a winter shelter spot, is we did some outreach, did the meeting ahead of time to answer questions. And I think that when people have information, um, it, it really benefits them. So um, uh, I'm supportive of, of uh, um, the motion here and the additional amendments, and uh, I think this is our, our first step forward. All right, so we have a motion and we have a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Uh, we now move on to uh, item number 11, which is a public hearing to consider a resolution uh, ordering the dissolution of the Pasatampo Rolling Woods Sewer Maintenance District as outlined in the memorandum of the Deputy CAO and the Director of Public Works. I uh, know. Feel free to be brief in your I will. comments. <laughs> <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chairman, Supervisors. Uh, my name is Matt Machado. I'm the Director of Public Works, and I, and I will be brief. Uh, this is a, a quick item. The item before you is a public hearing on the dissolution of the Pasatiempo Rolling Woods Sewer Maintenance District. The maintenance district was beneficial during the exploration of the feasibility of sewer disposal improvements in the greater Pasatiempo area. However, this maintenance district is no longer being utilized for sewer improvements in this area due to the expansion of CSA 10. And so the recommended action is to hold the public hearing for consideration of dissolution of the Pasatiempo Rolling Woods Sewer Maintenance District and to consider and adopt the resolution ordering the dissolution of the Pasatiempo Rolling Woods Sewer Maintenance District. And I can answer any questions you have. There is a bit of a history, but I won't delve into it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Seeing none, I'll open up for public comment. Seeing no public comment, I'll I'm, close. I move the recommended action. Second. Motion by Leopold, second by McPherson. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now move into closed session, uh, and I'll ask the uh, County Attorney, if there's any going to be any reportable action. There is. Okay, thank you.